Καλημέρα σας, good morning to everyone. My name is Angelos Thanasopoulos, I'm uh, the editor-in-chief of politics in newspaper of Ima in Athens. I have the, the honor to, uh, to chair the first session of, uh, of today's conference, uh, establishing a free, maritime, uh, a free and open maritime order cooperation between Greece and Japan. Uh, before we, we start the process of this, uh, of this conference, I would like first to, uh, to give the floor to uh, the Ambassador of Japan, uh, Mr. Nakayama, uh, in order to open the conference. Thank you. Uh, Professor Evangelis uh, of the Pantheon University, and distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen who are present here, and online viewers. Karimera Sas, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us today in this hybrid seminar entitled Establishing Free and Open Maritime Order, Cooperation Between Greece and Japan. This seminar is co-organized by the Embassy of Japan in Athens and the Institute of International Relations of the Pantheon Universities, IDIS, with cooperation from Elia Mep. I would like to express my heartfelt uh, gratitude to all the people concerned in IDIS and the LMF for their uh, contribution and cooperation in organizing this seminar. I also thank all the speakers and the moderators, um, uh, for both from Japan and Greece, for their participation. Today's discussion will be focused on the issue of maritime order in the Eastern Mediterranean, and East and South China Seas. All these seas have very significant strategic importance, uh, both in geopolitical and geoeconomic senses. In these seas, however, unilateral attempts to change the status quo and the illegal activities related to the demarcation uh, of the uh, maritime zones are taking place, which pose serious threat to the regional and international peace and stability. This seminar aims to examine what Japan and Greece, both robust maritime nations, strongly committed international law, including the UNCLOS, can do in achieving peace and stability in those areas. Prominent experts and policymakers, uh, both from Japan and Greece, will analyze and discuss the latest situation in these uh, areas and to explore possible cooperation among the countries uh, among the countries concerned towards building a stable international maritime order in both regions and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, the unfolding crisis in Ukraine caused by Russia's naked aggression is posing a gravest challenge ever to the existing international order, not only in Europe, but also in other parts of the world. Under such circumstances, it is extremely meaningful to consider how Japan and Greece and other like-minded countries can jointly contribute to the realization of regional and international peace and stability. I sincerely hope that discussions at this seminar would illuminate a future course of actions for our common cause. Thank you very much. Pastor, thank you so much. Uh, and now I, I will call Mr. Kostas Ifantis, uh, Professor and President of the Department for International, European and Area Studies in Panic University, uh, for his own opening remarks. Thank you, Professor. Thank you ever so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, let me express my gratitude uh, to the uh, Ambassador and to the Embassy staff uh, for the initiative this is a very rare occasion where um, a, the Institute of International Relations, Pandion University, uh, gets together with uh, the Embassy of Japan. We hope that uh, it will be the start, the beginning of a very fruitful uh, future uh, cooperation. Uh, we are uh, ready to avail ourselves, actually, uh, to uh, any uh, similar uh, academic uh, events. Uh, uh, special thanks to the students who turned up 
uh, although it is quite early. Thank you ever so much. And I'm looking forward to the workings of the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. So um, we will proceed uh, in the first session of this seminar, uh, the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, uh, it's always nice to uh, find myself in this um, very warm place where I, uh, I was a student for almost 10 years. So um, in the first panel, we have the following speakers. Uh, Mr. Alexandros Yakopoulos, who is going to be the keynote speaker of the first session, uh, former National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister of the Hellenic Republic and today Director General of International Cooperation in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Greece. He's our keynote speaker, as I said. He's also a Senior Policy Advisor in Eliamep. And with us today, we also find Mr. Yuichi Hosoya, uh, professor of international politics at Keio University in Tokyo. Uh, he, has also, he was also uh, a member of the Prime Minister's Advisory Board uh, on Reconstruction uh, of the Legal Basis for Security, Prime Minister's Advisory Panel on National Security and Defense Capabilities, in which he assisted in drafting uh, Japan's first national security strategy. Um, Mr. Ken Jimbo, who is going to join us uh, virtually, yeah, yeah. Um, professor at the Faculty of Policy and Management at Keio University, he served as Special Advisor to the Ministry of Defense uh, and Senior Advisor in the National Security Secretary from 2018 to 2020. And also virtually with us, Mr. Akio Takahara, uh, Professor in the University of Tokyo on Contemporary Chinese Politics and Diplomacy in the national relations in East Asia and Japan-China relations. And last but not least, uh, the good friend Petros Liakouras, professor of international law in the University of Piraeus and a research associate in, uh, in, the, the, in this in Pandi University. So I would like now to give the floor uh, to um, former Admiral and former National Security Advisor Diakopoulos for his keynote speech. Uh, some rules for the game. Uh, the keynote speaker will have approximately 15 minutes at his disposal to present his thesis, and then the rest of the uh, speakers around 10 minutes, uh, so that we don't lose track of time, and then if we have time, we'll uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, Mr. Diakopoulos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I have to make a small disclaimer. It doesn't count that on my 15 minutes. Uh, I'm here in my personal capacity. My former previous or whatever current positions have nothing to do the ideas or whatever I say express and represents me and only me so it's not official uh, this presentation in any way now the the subject is vast Eastern Mediterranean has been the last year's uh, hot spot in this planet but so I, I cannot cover it on the whole for 15 minutes I'll try to do my best to give some ideas Let's start about what the, the Eastern Mediterranean represents. At the crossroads of three continents, the East Med is a uniquely diverse, strategic, and consequently contested area. It represents a space of immense value, both for the global economy, as well as European security. The region encompasses a large part of the Middle East and North Africa, composed of nine littoral states and two key maritime choke points, namely the Dardanelles and the Suez Canal. This juncture of different political cultures paired with a tense geopolitical environment characterized by interstate and intrastate fault lines generates a chronic instability. Since the Arab uprisings, the Levant and the Masrek have become two of the world's most volatile regions. Out of the area's nine littoral states, six have been recently embroiled in violent struggles. U.S. relative decline of interest created a power vacuum that spawned new rivalries among regional and international actors. 
Consequently, the nature of the Middle East's relations with international powers has become multipolar in character, and Russia's role in regional security and China's in the regional economy have relatively increased. Accordingly, the role of the regional powers in shaping regional affairs has also relatively increased. The East Med's sea lines of communications remain crucial for the trade and energy shipments, with estimates suggesting that the trade flows within the Mediterranean account for as much as 25% of all international seaborne trade. These characteristics have rendered the Eastern Mediterranean a crucial geostrategic pivot, supremacy over which comes with far-ranging implications. The Eastern Mediterranean also provides the shortest maritime route between Asian and European markets, thanks to the Suez Canal that connects the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. Almost 12% of global commerce and over one trillion of US dollars worth of goods pass through the canal annually. The region also serves as an important route for transporting petroleum and gas for the Gulf, from the Gulf to the European markets. Approximately 70% of Europe's energy demands are transported through the Mediterranean annually. Maritime activities are already an important component of China's economy, and the country seeks to expand its international naval presence and operations by creating partnerships with ports which it has stakes. China also aims to ensure access to critical infrastructure and the resources it will need to drive economic growth. Maritime ports represent the cornerstone of the EU trade infrastructure, as 70% of goods crossing European borders travel by the sea. In this context, over the last decade, private and state-owned Chinese firms have acquired stakes in a large number of Mediterranean ports. This major investment reflects the fact that China considers the southern and eastern Mediterranean regions as strategic. You can see the ports on the slide. Subsequently, the control of the sea lines of communications and of the maritime choke points in the Mediterranean has great geostrategic and geoeconomic value. Now, the discovery of massive natural gas deposits underneath the eastern Mediterranean unfortunately exacerbated tensions, pre-existing tensions, and especially between Turkey and its neighbors. The US Global Survey estimates that as much as 122 trillion cubic feet of gas and 1.7 billion barrels of oil lie on the bed of the Eastern Mediterranean Basin. That amount of gas is equivalent to about 70, 76 years of gas consumption in the European Union. Literal states in the Eastern Mediterranean, with the notable exception of Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon, for different reasons, formed the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum to promote regional cooperation in the development of natural gas. Cyprus, Egypt, France, Greece, Italy, Israel, Jordan, and Palestine are full member states, while the EU and the US are observers. EMGF is an international organization and its headquarters are located in Cairo, Egypt. On September 22 of 2020, the members signed a formal charter to create a new intergovernmental organization. But the problem is Turkey didn't want to, to be part of it. And since 2016, Ankara has increased its confrontational tone and policies against both Greece and Cyprus and the West in general. Instead of cooperation, Turkey promulgated the illegitimate 
maximalist and aggressive doctrine of Mavivatan or Blue Homeland. September 1919, President Erdogan made an official visit to Istanbul's National Defense University. While there, he posed in front of a large map of Turkey titled Mavivatan. It depicted Turkey's maritime borders encompassing the islands of the Eastern Aegean and demarcating 462,000 square kilometer area around Asia Minor. The map depicted Ankara's maximalist claims encroaching upon the sovereign rights of Greece and Cyprus. Although initially seen by external observers as Turkey's claim to energy reserves in the Eastern Mediterranean, its scope is continental or even global. Exploiting natural resources is only part of the project, while control of the Eastern Mediterranean transit pathways to Europe appears to be the ultimate goal. I talked before about the strategic value of this control. The concept implicitly proposes that Turkey has to dominate the Mediterranean to reclaim the mercantile and maritime power once held by the Ottomans. The Blue Homeland Doctrine forms the crux of Turkey's interregional strategy. It is through this doctrine that Ankara seeks to dominate the Eastern Mediterranean. This region, being at the mouth of the Suez Canal, is a mandatory point of passage for trade routes linking Europe to the Indian Ocean and, by extension, to the Southeast Asia. It is also the main maritime interface of the Near East and the Masrek. Should Turkey succeed, it will control the sea routes from the Black Sea and Suez Canal to the Central Mediterranean, fulfilling Ankara's ambition to become a geostrategic and geoeconomic hub connecting Asia, Europe, and Africa. Whereas former Foreign Minister Davutoglu saw Anatolia as the hub between Europe, Africa, and Asia, the Eastern Mediterranean plays a similar role in the idea of the Blue Homeland straddling the Mediterranean basin, the Middle East, and the Indo-Pacific Indo space. To give a legal veneer to this doctrine, Turkey signed an illegitimate agreement with Libya's GNA, Government of National Accord, to establish a common maritime border. The absurdity of this it can be depicted on the, on the map. You see that the lines cross uh, the island of Crete. I'm not working to, I mean, the map speaks for itself. In flagrant violation of the law of the sea, the deal posits that islands, regardless of size, are not entitled to a continental shelf. Therefore, Greek islands, east of the 25th meridian, are under Turkish maritime jurisdiction. According to the EU Commission's 2021 report, this agreement ignored the sovereign rights of Greece in the area concerned, infringed upon the sovereign rights of third states, does not comply with the law of the seas and cannot produce any legal consequences for third countries. Using this agreement within the framework of the Blue Homeland Doctrine, Turkey projects power not only in the Aegean Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean, but also across the Central Mediterranean. By strengthening Turkey's Libyan military cooperation and encroaching on Greece's exclaimed exclusive economic zone, Turkey has shown it is not afraid of confrontation with those who would limit its maritime ambitions. It is precisely this freedom to exercise effective control over the region that represents the basis of Turkey's global strategic ambitions. To pursue its claims, the Turkish Navy utilizes area denial tactics to legitimize its control over the Blue Homeland area. 
Ankara has used warships, often participating in the Mediterranean Shield mission, to harass scientific research vessels and disrupt their work. This modern gunboat diplomacy proliferates as Ankara asserts control through its power to disrupt, which remain a key element of implied ownership. Disrupting everyone else's ability to conduct research still makes uh, Turkey the key regional power. I have it. this table is just a small part of what happened. Many research ships have been harassed, many of them threatened, and have in mind that according to the law of the seas, I mean, laying cables or even pipelines doesn't encroach on anyone's uh, continental shelf. Nevertheless, nothing can be done in Eastern Mediterranean without our consent. This phrase is a recurring motto in the statements of Turkish officials in the Eastern Mediterranean. In the Eastern Medi oh, sorry. In the Eastern Mediterranean, we raised our flag with our roots raised, the Barbaros and the Yavuz, and we showed that nothing can happen in the area that does not involve us. And President Erdogan said the same. Admiral, just to keep you in check, you have four minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. I know. The Turkish Navy uses all means available to disrupt the current status quo. In June 2020, a Turkish warship, fire control radars, target illuminated. A French frigate, Courbet. Courbet was part of a NATO mission and tried to search a Tanzanian ship under a, cooperated by a Turkish company who was clearly violating the embargo on, on Libya. Turkey has never hesit hesitated to tempt escalation in pursuit of the Blue Homeland. In November 2008, you had the Turkish vessel harassing uh, ships conducting explorations in the Cyprus uh, EZ. The same applied to the Greek and, uh, and uh, a Cypriot EZ during the Oruç race affair. And we have lately the Turkish ships harassing the research filter, uh, vessel Nautical Geo. Uh, Turkish warships approached up to 200 yards Nautical Geo and clearly threatened it. Here we, here we can see the Turkish survey ship Oruç race that reached <coughs> encroached on the Greek EZ and reached up to six miles from uh, Castellorizo and, and uh, Lindos. Now I finish. And I finishing, I have two quotes. One from the Ryan Gingeras. He's a Turkey expert in the Department of National Security Affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School. And pithily, he gave the whole picture. While regularly affirming Turkey's place in NATO, Erdogan's administration has spoken of Turkey as the leader of the Islamic world and the custodian of the old Ottoman order. He regularly denounces the tyranny of Western imperialism while promoting the emergence of a Eurasian consensus in conjunction with China and Russia. In both word and deed, his views on regional politics often betray signs of irredentism. Erdogan's revisionist tendencies are best exemplified by his support for the creation of a large blue homeland in Eastern Mediterranean. If he was to have his way, Greek sovereignty over its islands and waterways will be all but nullified. He wrote that in a recent article in the War on the Rocks. Read it. 
So, closing, I have to say, and regarding the, the, the concept of this conference, Turkey's blue homeland resembles China's nine dash line, which encompasses almost all of the South China Sea, both in its maximalist claims and its disregard for the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas. Of the sea. In a globalized and interconnected world, actions in one part of the world can reverberate and influence any other. In this respect, Turkey's actions in the Eastern Mediterranean could, quote unquote, legitimize China's corresponding actions in the South China Sea and vice versa. That would create a dangerous precedent for international law and consequently for the international order with dire consequences. Thank you very much and sorry for being long. Mr. Diakopoulos, thank you very much for this uh, um, Tour d'Horizon presentation and bringing back memories from uh, the hot uh, 2020 summer for all of us. And uh, also uh, opening the, the floor, actually, uh, for Mr. Hosoya, who will present us now um, actually a connection between the East Med situation and the South China Sea. Professor, please. Well, thank you very much for a very kind introduction. I like to use my PowerPoint uh, document in my presentation. And could you? See my presentation, please. Yes. Oh, yes, thank you very much indeed. Uh, first of all, let me express my gratitude for the University of Pantheon to organize this conference, as well as to a Japanese embassy in Athens to make this event possible. I'm particularly glad that there are so many students. I'm a university professor in Japan, and uh, in early morning, I usually don't expect many students in an event. But today, there are so many students, I'm very glad. So I heard that, of course, that Pantheon University is a top university, particularly on international relations. So i well convinced that uh, th this is a reason why uh, the university is so respected. There are so many students who are interested in international relations, because Japan is far away from you, from J Greece. But uh, nevertheless, I'm glad that you come here to uh, learn many things about uh, international relations, international relations in the, in the, in the Pacific region, and also uh, international relations uh, relating to uh, Eastern Mediterranean, and uh, of course, uh, related to the world. And I, I'm also very grateful that I'm together with my uh, two uh, respected colleagues and friends, Professor Takahara and Professor Jimbo. Professor Jimbo is my colleague, and he is the, perhaps the most respected scholar on Japanese security policy. And Professor Takara is the most respected scholar on uh, uh, Japanese scholar on Chinese politics. Uh, the, the two professors are perhaps the busiest professors in Japan, so on international relations. So it's really rare for me to be with them together in a session. So I'm, I'm sure that they will make a wonderful pre presentation afterwards. So let me focus on uh, one word, free and open in the Pacific. It's we call FOIP. FOIP is a kind of a buzzword or a keyword. And uh, maybe one of the most important words which uh, uh, remain after the COVID, after the COVID war, post-COVID war. So I really like you to remember this word, the FOIP, because uh, this will continue to be an important word. And this relates to my talk uh, today, this morning, uh, that, 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 that my talk relates to the fact that uh, Japan is very important to Greece and Greece is very important to Japan because of the FOIP. The FOIP is a kind of a key word to, to connect the world. The key pillar, one of the key pillars, there are three pillars in this strategy. And one of the pillars or three pillars of this strategy is connectivity. Connectivity means that Japan is trying to connect each region. And more importantly, last year, in last September, the EU, European Union, introduced EU's own version of Indo-Pacific strategy. And the key, uh, the pillar of that EU's strategy is Asian connectivity strategy. 
And I know that the policymaker within European Commission, European Union, actually learned many things from Japanese strategy, Japanese strategy of the FOIP. So there are, uh, there are commonalities between Japan's strategies of the Indo-Pacific FOIP and EU strategies. And the key is connectivity, try to connect each region. So that's why I think that this simply explains why Japan is important to Greece and Greece is important to Japan. And more importantly, uh, in East Mediterranean, Greece has been perhaps one of the most important countries in global competition in the last one century or more. Of course, I think that you are international relations student and scholar. That's why you know the world, Truman Doctrine of 1947. I'm a professor of international history, so I usually teach the Truman Doctrine of March 1947, when uh, American president, President Truman, introduced a new bill in the American Congress explaining the importance of Greece in American strategy because the UK at that time was abandoning, uh, providing financial aid to Greece because of its own economic crisis. That's why UK government asked US government to continue to provide financial aid to Greece because Greece is geopolitically perhaps one of the most important country. I think this continues still, that's why China is so much interested in Greece. We are seeing a global competition between sheep powers and land powers. Of course, in 19th century, sheep power was the UK, and 20th century, sheep power was the United States. Of course, in 21st century, United States remained one of the most important sheep powers. But Japan is supporting the United States in this vision. I mean, in this vision is trying to maintain a sheep power's influence in the world. And also, China and Russia are continental powers, land power. That's why they're expanding their influence. And we are seeing a global competition between liberal democracies and uh, authoritarian regimes, or global competition between United States and China. It's a kind of a con structural confrontation. And the Japanese strategy is important to try to soften that global competition uh, from the point of view of expanding the importance of both rule of law and open and stable sea. I will explain why. Uh, could you move to the next slide, please? This is the outline of my talk. And the first one is that Japan has been playing a leading role in consolidating the free and open in the Pacific since Shinzo Abe came into office in 2006. And though he formalized, as uh, Shinzo Abe, Prime Minister, formalized that vision in August 2016, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe launched this diplomatic initiative in Kenya, Nairobi. Of course, Kenya, Nairobi is far away from Japan. The reason why Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe launched this idea in Kenya is East Africa is the key to Japanese, the success of Japanese strategy. There are key, two key regions. One is East Africa. The second one is South Asia. It's a kind of a in the, in the Indian Ocean rim countries. Why these two regions are important? Because, because now in East Asia, particularly in Northeast Asia, Japan, Korea, China are entering into aging society. We are becoming rapidly older. So that's why the market, the size of the market in Northeast Asia is shrinking. It means that Japan needs another market to enhance Japanese economy. So that's why Japan is trying to expand and connect with these areas, I mean two areas, East Africa and South Asia. Because in the 21st century world, the two regions, South Asia and East Africa, will become the most important or most dynamic economic regions in the world. So. The, 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 the aim of Japanese diplomatic strategy is to connect East Asia or Northeast Asia with these two regions, in the Pacific Rim region, I mean East Africa and South Asia. The reason why I really like to emphasize on the importance of Greece and East Mediterranean is that U European Union is following the same path, same strategy as Japanese strategies. As I explained, Last year in September 2021, the European Union launched a new strategy 
for Indo-Pacific. And of course, it uses a phrase connectivity. So there are many overlapping areas between Japanese strategy and European strategy. Of course, Greece is a member state, important member state of the European Union. And European Union is trying to connect the European Union with in the Pacific region. If the European Union is trying to connect EU with in the Pacific region, the key is, of course, East Mediterranean and the Middle East. With other stability in East Mediterranean and Middle East, it's totally impossible for the European Union to connect directly with in the Pacific region. That's why it is really important for both Japan and the EU to see the stable stability and openness in the region, I mean, Eastern Mediterranean. But to some extent, Russian and the Chinese strategies are different because they more or less try to control the areas to establish by establishing a kind of a sphere of influence in the area. So Russian strategy is a kind of a strategy to expand its sphere of influence. And on the other hand, China is trying to expand its BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, by including some of the areas or regions. Of course, as well, East Mediterranean is important, a key region. China has been emphasizing, emphasizing on the importance of the region, I mean the East Mediterranean. So the, another important Japanese effort is try to combine two things, China's BRI and Japan's FOI. Because China is Japan's biggest trading partner. That's why we cannot simply ignore China, the importance of China. But on, but on the other hand, we need to, liberal democracies need to be in the driving seat rather than just following Chinese initiative. That's why Japanese strategies is a kind of an alternative strategy to China's Belt and Road Initiative. But at the same time, of course, we cannot ignore the importance of China. So that's why it is important for Japan to try to create a new strategy which can be accommodated with Chinese initiative. So I usually call this as FOIP 2.0. FOIP 2.0 is different from FOIP 1.0 because FOIP 1.0 is a kind of a containment strategy against China, trying to contain China. And the United States has been using this previous strategy, trying to encircle China. But Japanese strategy is different. Japanese strategy is much more inclusive strategy, inclusive strategy to accommodate with other power, leading power, such as China, and of course, uh, to some extent, other powers as well. So in that sense, I think that the Japanese strategy is different, particularly by emphasizing on the importance of 0. But at the same time, it is very difficult to, for Japan to continue this strategy because of the increasing confrontation between the United States and China. And Japan and the EU are in a similar position. United States strategy is quite confrontational to China, try to decouple the world. But Japan's strategy is much more inclusive. So Japan's strategy is similar to EU's strategy. The key is, key pillar is, as I explained, connectivity. To try to emphasize on the connectivity, it will become possible to connect each region. I mean, East Asia, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia, Middle East, East Africa, Eastern Mediterranean, and Europe, European Union. So by promoting that connectivity strategy, I think that we can ensure a kind of a stability and openness. So I stop here before entering into the main slides, but maybe I used already two minutes. You have three minutes. Right. But uh, maybe, uh, well, I think uh, Professor Jimbo and Takahara will uh, talk a similar kind of thing. So, so I would like to give them my three minutes. Thank you so much for being so kind. The moderator has to be invisible, but also strict. So um, I would like to give the, the virtual floor to, uh, to Professor Jimbo. Professor, the floor is yours. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and uh, thanks uh, for the kind invitation to this uh, very important uh, forum. Um, very uh, 
pleased to be uh, getting in touch uh, with uh, uh, all the scholars and uh, uh, audiences uh, at Athen, uh, Greece. And uh, uh, my only regret uh, is that I cannot be with you uh, in person, uh, but I uh, let me try to contribute uh, from my own hometown, Tokyo, uh, to participate in, in this event. Uh, just let me follow up uh, with uh, uh, Professor Hosoya's uh, very, uh, I think, uh, uh, excellent speech on the uh, explaining current uh, Japanese engagement in the concept of the uh, Indo-Pacific. And I do fully agree with uh, Professor Hosoya uh, that uh, Indo-Pacific uh, 2.0 uh, has a more, I think, playground uh, for uh, many players uh, to uh, actually um, uh, engage in. Um, and it is not the uh, ownership of Japan uh, or the United States, uh, but everybody can claim the copyright uh, of this concept because everybody has the different uh, prioritization and but uh you know with uh using the indo-pacific uh that has become some of the gravity uh that uh, uh actually that uh, everybody's interest can be reflected uh in this uh concept so uh, i think uh, uh we are particularly uh, uh grateful uh that uh, uh eu member states uh beginning from like uh uk netherlands uh, germany and france have come up with our own uh, Indo-Pacific strategy and also the e European Union itself uh, have uh, actually, uh, you know, outlined uh, its own uh, regional engagement strategy by uh, using uh, this concept. So something that we can really, uh, you know, move on from here uh, is using this uh, common platform. Uh, what will be the uh, kind of penetrating principle uh, that we can uh, really share? So uh, I think in line with uh, you know the first presentation about uh, maritime order in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean, uh, I know there has been uh, the you know the principal uh, debates uh, between uh, Greece and Turkey uh, over how you can de uh, deal with uh, you know uh, the, uh, the the gas pipeline issues and gas fields, um, uh, you know EEZ boundary issues and uh, all there. But I think uh, Japan uh, is also very much interested in how those international rules and norms uh, should be uh, in order uh, to deal uh, with those uh, dispute settlement uh, issues. Um, I don't think everybody can really take a size of those uh, you know, disputes, but I, you know, I, I think international community takes size on the principle. Exactly the same as what we are trying to see as a, 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 the current uh, Russian-Ukraine uh, war, uh, we, we take a size uh, very firmly because the Russian violated uh, very clearly about the international law. So I think uh, in, in looking at the maritime order, which we're going to uh, discuss uh, in, in the coming sessions, and I think how, how much we can really share those kind of uh, principle approach uh, to deal with issue uh, is, I think, a fundamental uh, issue uh, to be pursued by Japan and the Greece. Uh, those are my initial reaction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. And um, I would like to uh, to pass the virtual floor to uh, to Mr. Takahara for his own intervention. Professor, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Chair. I would like first to echo my uh, Japanese colleagues, um, thanking the organizers, especially the University of Pantheon and the Embassy of Japan, um, to make this wonderful workshop possible. And thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, I would like to first say, mention the interesting comparison that was made by Admiral Diakopoulos, um, the comparison between the East Mediterranean and the South China Sea. Um, ill behavior, yes, is contagious, isn't it? So uh, it was uh, fascinating for a person like me who um, have not been in the East Mediterranean for many, many years. Um, I have a happy memory of uh, visiting or backpacking your beautiful country in 1979. And I remember taking a boat from Samos Island to Turkey uh, near Ephesus. So I realized today how much things have um, changed uh, since then. Um, one point I would like to make is that, yes, we have troubles with our neighbors. Japan has troubles with uh, China, but um, uh, with your neighbor, 
uh, no matter how much trouble you have, at the same time, you have to coexist uh, with your neighbor. Uh, so what's the way to do that? You know, uh, as far as Japan is concerned, uh, we have had a lot of trouble with uh, China after its rise. Uh, we helped China rise economically. We welcome China's economic rise. We actually benefit from that too. Um, but as you know, the Chinese policy is to develop its military might along with the development uh, in its economic uh, cloud. And uh, for the past 20 years, approximately, I would say, uh, we have had to live with this contradiction. That is, on the one hand, we need to compete with China because China is actually exerting its physical pressure on us by sending the Coast Guard vessels. I will be um, discussing this more in detail in the next session, uh, but also uh, by the increase in the uh, naval forces and the Air Force uh, capabilities um, around Japan. So uh, there's no other way for us than to compete very hard on one front, but at the same time, uh, as was mentioned, uh, our economic cooperation with China is deepening uh, almost every day because uh, after all, the globalization in, uh, especially in the economic world continues and we do benefit from that. So this is a very difficult situation uh, for, for Japan and um, we are sort of always, every day, looking for the right balance uh, between competition and cooperation. But we know that this balancing act is going to be increasingly difficult uh, because on the one hand, competition is going to intensify and on the other hand, cooperation is going to deepen. Uh, so internally, uh, the debate over our neighborhood policy is going to intensify since if you focus on um, security issues, then uh, you would sort of argue that there's no room for cooperation uh, with your neighbor. But if you focus on the cooperation side of things, you know, there's no time for us to compete, but we should rather uh, cooperate uh, in a full way. Uh, so the leader of the nation uh, has to have a very firm position, ready to uh, convince both sides that the middle way is the only way uh, to, to go. Uh, and this will need a lot of political clout. Um, so whether a leader has that capability is going to be very important uh, for the country to uh, go the right path. So that's one point. And the second point is that um, I think in Europe, uh, I would say that um, you would have more regional institutions to turn to uh, than um, in East Asia. Uh, so uh, from that standpoint, um, we sort of envy your or, uh, international uh, situation. Uh, there's NATO. I don't know how NATO is going to play a role in uh, solving the problems that you mentioned, uh, but um, the regional institutions in East Asia are still weak. Uh, and there is a big need for us to uh, further develop the regional institutions, but um, and this is also very difficult in the kind of contradiction uh, that I mentioned. Uh, let me stop here. Those are my initial remarks. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor Takahara, thank you so much. Uh, now I would like to uh, pass the actual floor, physical floor, to uh, Professor Lyakouras from uh, the Periodic University. Professor, please. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the invitation from Japanese Embassy and Peace Ambassador. Thank you for the invitation from Pantheon University, Costa. A bit. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm a discussant. I'm not going to have a, a main speech, but anyway, I have to fill some of the gaps and say some more things about uh, what is going on with Eastern Mediterranean. First of all, I have to point out that uh, in Eastern Mediterranean, um, we have actually three exclusive economic zone delimitation agreements. These are uh, 
uh, with the center of Cyprus, with uh, Egypt 2003, Lebanon 2007, and Israel 2010. Of the three of them, only two are in force. The one with Lebanon is pending delimitation. Why? Because right after the uh, delimitation agreement was concluded between Israel and uh, Cyprus, uh, Lebanon protested, saying that this is not actually the right delimitation, the lateral delimitation line, which was drawn uh, according to the uh, Israel-Cyprus agreement. Uh, and the reason why, if I can show this, I have to go through many of this. If I can show this, you can see that, that Lebanon now claims an area of 17 square kilometers between the two states. So that was the very first dispute concerning the delimitation agreements uh, uh, of Cyprus with the, th with the three other nations. So in that case, Lebanon is out of the delimitation uh, agreements. Uh, and of course, there, we have only two of them in force. Uh, but the main uh, objector of these delimitation agreements was Turkey, and still is Turkey. And why is that so? Because Turkey, uh, first of all, has an objection as to this agreement because it was concluded by Cyprus. Cyprus um, government is not recognized right now, right now by Turkey. So Turkey disputes this delimitation, saying that the delimitation is wrong. First of all, because uh, Cyprus as an island cannot have any claim to full effect to the western part of this. And second, because uh, Turkey is uh, planning a uh, delimitation with Egypt based on a median line from the Turkish coast to the coast of Egypt. And that was also a proposal made some po at some point in 2011 from Turkey to Egypt in order to annul the 2003 agreement and have a more profiting for Egypt delimitation agreement. But that was not possible because agreements, especially concerning delimitation lines and delimitation borders, is not easy at all to change uh, or to annul or to invalidate, unless there are some other reasons that are according to the law of treaties. So in this case, um, uh, Turkey, uh, especially after 2011, when Cyprus started this exploitation program and uh, having also platforms and other uh, vessels uh, for search of the seismic data, Turkey reacted besides uh, the one that uh, happened in 2011. And of course, it uh, drew a line delimitation line between Turkey and the so-called Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. This agreement cannot be upheld because Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, as it is uh, known, uh, cannot be a state, is not a state, because it has been annulled by a Security Council resolution. So in, that, in any case, cannot be a state and agreements are concluded only between states and nothing else. So um, Turkey, after that, started a series of events and series of claims. First of all, disputing delimitation agreements of Cyprus, especially with um, uh, Egypt and, of course, with Israel. So the very first was, of course, uh, going at the southern part of this uh, Cyprus state, disputing the delimitation, saying that, uh, of course, uh, uh, Turkey claims these areas not because of Turkey, otherwise it would have been a sort of cut-off effect and Turkey could, could not claim any parts of this, but it said that it is uh, acting on behalf of the so-called Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. But after that, Turkey started also uh, not only searching for seismic data in this delimited area, 
but also started drilling in these delimited areas. And that came to my mind, and that came to all of us mind, what the court, the uh, arbitral tribunal, said in the South China Sea case. And in this, uh, in this case, uh, between Philippines and China, concerning South China Sea of 2016, the International Tribunal condemned China for occupying parts of Philippines' exclusive economic zone by constructing artificial islands and fishing, as well as threatening with presence of naval forces. This includes everything. And as the tribunal stressed, Philippines are impeded from exercising legal rights within their exclusive economic zone. In the arbitral uh, view, China has not acted in good faith. If we put it in application to what Turkey has done so far, we can say that Turkey at least is not acting in good faith because the delimitation between two states is an act of good faith because they acted in good faith and concluded an agreement because they are also opposite states, opposite coastal states. So in the opposite states, of course, you can draw a line where you can uh, really divide the two areas, what, which one appertains to each coastal state. And in fact, as we can say, uh, any state, of course, may raise disputes. However, in case of dispute in undelimited areas, and of course in delimited areas of continent, a state cannot invoke claims by occupying or behaving in view to profit by a uh, fait accompli to the detriment of another claimant of the same maritime area. So in fact, as we can say, Turkey seems as it plans the enclaving on Cyprus. It is really visible from, from our maps, uh, defeating the latter, Cyprus, from any sovereign rights with regard to hydrocarbons to either delimited or undelimited uh, maritime areas. So this happens, uh, happened until, uh, let's say, 2019. And of course, we can see that there is a plan on the part of Turkey to exclude islands from letting them uh, claim uh, the so-called uh, full effect. I mean, full effect means the projection of the coasts to an area which can also uh, uh, reach the, the, the limit with the, with the other, uh, the projection of the opposite state. So first of all, uh, starts all this, and then of course, in different, in two, during 2019, in different letters submitted to the UN Secur uh, uh, Secretary General, the uh, Turkey, of course, uh, started showing for example, like uh, uh, what are the uh, claims of Turkey in uh, Eastern Mediterranean? This is the first part of it, of 2019. Uh, it is, uh, as you can see, it's not cutting in the middle roads, but it is something that, it is, that comes before. During 2019, besides the claims around Cyprus, and Turkey started from Syria, Turkey border to the, uh, let's say to the 28th meridian. 28th meridian is the one cutting roads in half. So in that case, another letter coming on 13th of November, really announcing what was going to happen afterwards, Turkey said that to the western part of this, we are going to delimit with all relevant coast, coastal states, the neighboring coastal states. What happened after that? The Turkish Libya MOU. What uh, was the Turkish Libyan MOU? Of course, in the, in the letter of 13 November that uh, came, that preceded the um, the, the Turkish uh, Libyan MOU, uh, Turkey, of course, said something in the annex of this, saying that 
Of course, the islands, meaning the Greek islands, can enjoy the territorial sea sovereign rights or the rights to sovereignty of the territorial sea, but not beyond of this point of six nautical miles, because after that, they will encroach Turkey's continent itself. That was something that was a pre-announcement of what was going to happen after that. And of course, what happened after that was the Turkish Libyan uh, MOU. The Turkish Libyan MOU. Professor, you have four minutes. Okay. Uh, the the Turkish Libyan MOU, as uh, Greece said, and most of the states said, uh, it is a real violation of international law of the sea. First of all, because it is not done by uh, opposite states, as uh, as uh, Admiral Diakopoulos just mentioned. And of course, that one is. Uh, um, goes to the detriment of the Greek uh, rights in the same area. It's not binding on Greece. It's not binding on Egypt either. But because of the objections of these states, this cannot constitute a so-called objective regime, which means that cannot be uh, undertaken as an obligation to any other state to say that this is a, a delimitation area. And the second, of course, is that this is according to the law of treaties. A treaty is binding only between the contracting parties, no one else, unless there is consent of, a, of any third party. Consent here does not exist. So Greece was free of any obligations. And say, meaning that Greece was also free to conclude an agreement with Egypt, which happened in 2020 on the 6th of August. Afterwards, Turkey reacted and reacted in a very, let's say, abrupt way because an, a, a research vessel called the Oruç Reis really started uh, uh, searching for seismic data. In order to go to an exclusive right, because exploration is the first part of the exploitation of continental self rights, sovereign rights. And in order to go for an exclusive right like this, then first you have to delimit the area, either by agreement or by a judicial judgment. So there is no other way because you exclude someone else only by that because this is what the uh, the, the ANCLOS, ANCLOS in this uh, provision, 74 for exclusive economic zone, 83 for continent ASEAN, is not merely a conventional provision. It is a customary law provision, meaning that it is binding erga omnes, including, of course, Turkey, because Turkey is not a party to Anglos. Now we have two, uh, we have actually two delimitation agreements that overlap. This is a real legal dispute. How it can be solved? Of course, not going unilaterally, but of course, going through a special agreement in order to find recourse to the International Court of Justice or to any other kind of tribunal not using, of course, the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea because Turkey is not a party to the uh, to ANCLOS, so it cannot be. But in this case, uh, if we can, if, if, if something like this can happen, then, of course, it would be easier. Is it possible? For now on, it is possible only for Libya. Why? Libya, right after the conclusion of the, the, of the MOU, Sent uh, the, the Libyan um, foreign minister, Siala, sent a letter, submitted a letter to the United Nations uh, Security Co uh, Secretary General saying that um, if anyone, any of the coastal neighbor coastal states consider that they are injured by this delimitation agreement, of course they can have recourse to the International Court of Justice. This is an implicit, as I say, implied uh, recognition that if any state have recourse to the International Court of Justice, 
Libya will participate. And this is a very strong position for this in order to go, first of all, with uh, Egypt uh, against, uh, let's say, uh, versus Libya. And of course, in that case, it is not probable, it is, it's going to happen, that Turkey will intervene. Uh, so that would be a good, uh, a good idea of solving the problem. Otherwise, there is no other solution left. I'm stopping here. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Professor Lagoras. Now, uh, we, are, uh, we have reached uh, the time limit of this session. Uh, I would like to ask the organizers if we have the time for a couple of questions. You do? Okay. So I would like to give the floor to the gentleman. You just have to state who you are and where you come from. Uh, just uh, in order to respect the, Hello? You know, the, the audience and the speakers, please do not uh, overuse your time and probably stick to questions if you can. Thank you. Uh, my name is Onur Katmerci. I'm a counselor from Turkish Embassy in Athens. I am uh, very happy to be back here because I am a graduate of uh, Kapodistrian University of Athens. That was 20 years ago. I'm very happy to be back here. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. I especially thanks to uh, Japanese Embassy for inviting me. And uh, it's been a really useful uh, uh, topic and it's a very hot topic. But uh, of course, uh, naturally, I have to uh, I have to reject some of the claims made here. Uh, I believe that what has been said here, what has been explained with maps, shows that we have to uh, sit down and talk in good faith, in good neighborly relations, and we have to uh, fix our problems together. And uh, until to the limits uh, of what we can fix, we can uh, fix together. But if at some point, if we cannot agree, then we can, of course, recourse to the International Court of Justice. And uh, sorry for my mask. Um, okay. So, okay. Much better. Okay. Uh, it's it's became really habitual of wearing this mask. But in any case, um, we are open to dialogue normally with our neighbor, and especially in these uh, dire times. A security landscape of European security ar 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 architecture is uh, um, really fluid and completely changing and I think it is uh, more urgent than ever for us to uh, uh, to cooperate and uh, coordinate our actions and um, solve our uh, problems in good faith. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, um, respecting the time. Now, we have uh, time for one more question. So, does any of the students want, and because I have the light, if someone I cannot see, just shout and then we'll spot you. If not, uh, we'll have a coffee break for 10 minutes or less. Okay. So, 10.30, everybody back to their seats. Uh, I would like to thank yes. And thank you for being here and uh, observing the panel. Thank you so much. So do we can start our second session on the situation in the Eastern South China Seas. Professors uh, Hosoya, Jimbo, Takahara, and the Tide Admiral Diakopoulos have already been presented by the previous moderator. Together with this panel, we also have two younger colleagues, Sofia Galani, the newest member of uh, our department, and uh, Professor Konstantinos Tsimonis, who is a lecturer in Chinese studies at King College, uh, London. So let me start uh, by giving the floor to Professor Hosoya. Okay, can I start? Well, once again, thank you very much for uh, coming back to this room in the second session. It's a long day. And I, I did, before the conference, I didn't know that I need to appear in every session, either as a speaker or moderator. <laughs> so uh, maybe I will shorten my talk, uh, try to re uh, 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 shrink my talk, because on this topic, 
it, well, I really like to say that the Professor Jimbo and Professor Takaara are really a, a great experts on the field, particularly Professor Jimbo is well known on his research on uh, uh, well, a maritime problem, uh, mar maritime problems or uh, disputes both in Ch South China Sea and East China Sea. So I think that uh, they can uh, explain uh, the, 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 the current situation very deeply. And I just like to uh, uh, provide a kind of outline from a historical point of view because I'm a historian. So I will try to, in my uh, less than 10 minutes, I will try to describe a kind of an outline of the problem uh, of East China Sea, South China Sea, because uh, in, I, I suppose that uh, even though you are, many of you are uh, international relations students or scholars, East China Sea, South China Sea are far away, far away from Greece, and maybe some of the problems are not quite well known to some people as uh, students here in Greece. First of all, uh, it, during the Second World War, Japan occupied both seas. I mean, East China Sea, South China Sea. It was, Japan was empire. It was a great empire in East Asia. So after the war began, Japan uh, uh, occupied both East China Sea, South China Sea. So uh, Japan, of course, wa was the biggest naval power around that time. Only the United States was equal to Japanese naval power because the United States was far away from uh, that region. So Japan could enjoy a freedom of controlling or navigating in the area, both East China Sea, South China Sea. And China didn't have an efficient Navy and R Soviet Union didn't have a, a powerful Navy after the Russo-Japanese War. In 1904 and five, uh, Japan fought a war against Russia and the uh, Japanese Navy could uh, destroy the large part of Russian Navy. So that's why since uh, uh, after that, uh, Soviet Union couldn't enjoy a powerful naval influence around the area. So in that sense, Japan could enjoy a kind of a, a domination, a maritime domination around the area. Uh, but, but of course, Japan was defeated. In, after 1945, August 1945, Japan was defeated and Japan lost a large part of its maritime power. And then afterwards, of course, the United States and the, the, the allied power, the United States, UK, and the Soviet Union began to expand in the area to control some of the seas around that. And uh, East China Sea, South China Sea, basically United States could, could control East China Sea after the war. And in South China Sea, uh, United States, uh, UK and uh, also uh, Soviet Union began to expand the influence in the area. And uh, the new tide began in 1980s. In 1980s, Soviet Union began to expand the influence around that area because uh, in Europe, after 1975, there was a deal, an agreement between uh, West and the East and at the Helsinki. And that's why, uh, based upon that agreement, the, the international relations or confrontation in Europe was largely frozen. So since 1970s, Soviet Union began to expand its influence, not in Europe, but other parts of the world, such as Asia and Africa and the Middle East as well. So in 1980s, Soviet Union began to its, uh, uh, expand its influence and particularly in 19, uh, uh, since 1983, Three, Soviet Union began to construct a huge naval base in Cam Ranh Bay uh, in Vietnam. So Vietnam uh, was a socialist country and Vietnam was fighting a war against China around that time. So that's why the uh, uh, Soviet Union provided, because there was a time for the Soviet-China confrontation in 1980s. That's why in 1980s, Soviet Union began to provide an assistance, military assistance to Vietnam and then uh, in 19, from 1983 onwards, Soviet Union con began to construct a, a, the largest naval base uh, in Kamran Bay outside of the Soviet Union. But uh, of course, after that, Soviet Union declined. Because of the decline of the Soviet economy, Soviet Union needed to reduce its economy, uh, military budget. And then in 1990, at last, 
at the end of the Cold War, Soviet Union decided to abandon the Kamran Bay. So largely, Soviet <coughs> Union retreated, from, began to retreat from the Kamran Bay, abandoning the military asset naval base there. That was 1990. And also similar things happened in uh, 1992. 1992, the United States, uh, before that, had a large military base in Subic Bay in the Philippines. But uh, uh, the Philippine uh, parliament began to criticize uh, the American uh, stationing there because uh, 1992, many people felt the Cold War was over. That's why they began to wonder why it was necessary to have American military base in the Subic Bay. So the, the Philippine people, Filipino began to criticize it and deny the existence of American military power in the region. So Soviet Union retreated, Soviet force retreated from the region and the United States began to retreat from the region and it was a time, I mean the 1990s, because many people felt that the Cold War was over. So there was no more necessary to see the huge presence of Soviet or Russian power, naval power, and American naval power there. And at the same time in 1992, it was a time when the, the Chinese government created a new territorial sea law. Since then, they began to claim the islands and the territory in the area, both in East China Sea and the South China Sea. So we saw twice the power vacuum. In 1945, we saw the emergence of power vacuum, vacuum of power in, in the region, I mean the East China Sea, South China Sea. And also in 1992, we once again uh, saw the power vacuum, emergence of power vacuum in East China Sea, South China Sea. And China fulfilled it. China began to construct a large navy since then, and then China began to occupy some of the islands, both in East China Sea, South China Sea. But United States uh, wasn't fully aware of the beginning of the creation of a huge naval uh, power of China there, because at that time, Chinese military power was totally small. Uh, Japan's budget for the self-defense force was nearly 10 times bigger than Chinese People's Liberation Army's budget. So we didn't really care about the danger or the power of Chinese Navy there. So we were quite optimistic about the future, but we began to wonder whether China was trying to occupy some of the islands. So after that, the pro problem emerged particularly since the Obama administration, the United States began to, be, began to be aware of the fact that China was expanding its influence around the, around the area. So that, that's why now we see the confrontation between Chinese presence and American presence, both in East China Sea and South China Sea. So this is a historical background. And then I think that uh, Professor Jim Bond and Professor Takahara will follow up with much more details, explanation about what's happening now. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. All right, I, I now give the floor to Professor Takahara for a keynote speech on the situation in the East and South China Seas. Professor, please. Hey, thank you very much. Um, on the South China is, uh, Sea issue in particular, as uh, Hosea Sensei mentioned, uh, Jimbo Sensei, is the best person to speak, but um, uh, let me show you some slides to give you uh, some images about the situation. And I'm going to share the slides with you now. And I hope you can see them. Okay. So the topic is the situation in, in the uh, East and South China Seas. I'm sorry, I should have brought a map of the East China Sea, but uh, please imagine a map of Japan. Uh, Japan is actually quite long. The Japanese archipelago extends from the Northeast to the Southwest and the uh, Senkaku Islands, you know, the place of contention between Japan and China is at the very tip of the Southwestern um, part of Japan, very close 
to the Chinese um, continent. Uh, that's the place in question. Um, but not only that, uh, the East China Sea as a whole, of course, is now a um, uh, theater for the Chinese um, forces to exert pressure on the Japanese side. But anyhow, it started over the Senkakus. And this is what happened, I'm afraid, in many cities in China in September 2012. I don't know whether you've seen uh, these photos of violence, um, violent demonstrations that took place in many Chinese cities in September 2012. Uh, why did this happen? Why were the Chinese so angry? Uh, well, of course, because they um, listened to the narrative provided by the Chinese uh, Communist Party over these islands. You know, the Senkaku Islands, Japan has owned and, and administered for over a century. And the Chinese first acknowledged that. And it was only in December 1971 that they started claiming sovereignty over these islands. So all the maps that were printed in China before that time, they all say uh, the islands, they call the islands Senkakus and not the Diaoyu, uh, which is the Chinese name. Uh, so uh, the history of China's claims over, uh, you know, the claims of sovereignty over the Diaoyu is actually not that long. But um, now, of course, they are telling, they're teaching their Chinese um, children uh, that uh, these uh, um, are Chinese territory uh, that we should own and the uh, Japanese are illegally uh, administering them, etc. And the immediate um, issues or events, incidents that triggered uh, such violence, uh, there were two. One is the collision uh, between a Chinese trawler, a fishing boat, and uh, two Japanese Coast Guard vessels that took place in September 2010. And two years later, the Japanese government decided to purchase uh, some of the islands. You know, there's, there's a, a series of islands um, originally owned by a private owner, a private land landlord. Uh, but in order to, um, uh, what's the word, to administer the situation uh, better to manage the situation better, uh, the Japanese government decided to purchase the islands and the Chinese government uh, thought about it for a moment. There were two different views. One thought that uh, we shouldn't react so um, assertively or aggressively uh, because only this is only a matter on paper, you know, the transfer of ownership of this particular piece of land you know, from a private person to a government. So. The Chinese reaction should also be a peaceful one on paper. But on the other hand, uh, there were many who thought that this was an opportunity, you know, so let's say this is a provocation from the Japanese side and we will act, we will actually act physically uh, to um, uh, exert pressure on Japan and if possible uh, to take the administration over uh, these I islands. So. These two incidents were what the Chinese side focused on and said that uh, Japan, it's the Japanese side that's provoking us, that's changed this policy, becoming more assertive. So we have to respond to this. This is the narrative that many Chinese believe at the moment. And for example, this is the drawing that um, the Xinhua News Agency, the national news agency of China under the control of the Chinese Communist Party, one day after the collision, uh, they distributed this um, neatly drawn picture uh, depicting uh, two Japanese big Coast Guard vessels hitting the belly uh, of a Chinese uh, trawler. So this is a version that the Chinese people got. Uh, but the Japanese side has a completely um, opposite view of the situation, as you can uh, imagine. And uh, as Hosea sensei just mentioned, uh, we think that the problem started way back, uh, much earlier after the end of the Cold War uh, for China and actually for Japan too, but there was no more the threat of the Soviet Union. So the Chinese started to advance into the maritime front, the maritime theater, and uh, from changing, from introducing the law of the territorial sea and the contiguous zone, gradually Chinese side started to change the status quo, not only legally, but also uh, started to move physically. I'm not going to go into detail of each development, um, but uh, 
already in 2006, this uh, Chinese state agency introduced a system to regularly patrol the maritime interests in the East China Sea. And uh, based on this new policy, two years later in 2008, for the first time, Chinese patrol boats intruded into the territorial waters to claim sovereignty. This was actually the first time in December 2008 that the Chinese Coast Guard vessels actually uh, intruded into the territorial waters around the Senkaku Islands to claim uh, sovereignty. And um, then gradually, as if they were slicing salami, the Chinese started to act uh, in a more uh, assertive or aggressive way. Uh, so this is actually the Japanese version of what happened uh, when the trawler and the Coast Guard vessels collided. Um, so you can still see this YouTube if you are in interested in actually what happened. Uh, so if you see this, it's, you very clearly understand that this is just a political fab fabrication uh, to show to the Chinese people that the uh, blame should be on the, on the Japanese side. But, it's, uh, but this is actually what happened. Uh, anyhow, so to, 2008 at the very left side here, it indicates two uh, Chinese uh, vessels intruded into the territorial waters. This was the first time. But after the, the big clash between Japan and China in September 2012, over the purchasing of these islands by the Japanese government from the private landlord, you see how many vessels have started to intrude into the territorial waters as indicated by the red and into the contiguous zones just around the uh, territorial waters indicated uh, in, in blue. So uh, you see the pressure that we're getting and not only the Coast Guard vessels, but also around or behind them, uh, always there's, there are the naval uh, vessels. And in the South China Sea, I think you are more familiar perhaps with what's going on in the South China Sea. Uh, the Chinese also started to uh, advance in, uh, physically in a, in a more aggressive way. So they uh, pulled this um, uh, rig uh, to explore oil and started uh, drilling uh, near the parasols where the Vietnamese, of course, are also claiming uh, sovereignty, very problematic. Uh, they created all these artificial islands, you know, destroying all the coral reefs. Um, and uh, uh, as was introduced in the previous session, uh, the um, uh, Hague International Arbitral uh, Court um, uh, came out with a ruling that this was all illegal, but the Chinese uh, simply ignored that. Uh, so the common concerns about Chinese actions is that uh, they just act, act, they just move and establish uh, phase accompli. Um, and the concrete acts are listed here. <laughs> I don't think we need to uh, you know, go into detail. Uh, but I would say there's a lot of action first ism, as it were. So when the Chinese find an opportunity to act, they will just act and let diplomacy take care of the rest because they believe in power, they believe in money. Uh, so no matter what we do, uh, all the um, other countries first may uh, complain, but eventually they will have to accept uh, the deeds that uh, we, we make. That kind of attitude is becoming very prominent and no one's happy about that. Uh, but their words, the Chinese words are very soft, very nice, right? Uh, they always talk about um, the importance of uh, sovereignty, territorial in integrity, uh, solving um, conflicts through peaceful means. But in fact, what they do are quite different from what they say. Uh, there's such a contrast between their soft words and their tough deeds. And why is this the case? Uh, we can think of many uh, causes or many reasons. You know, in the past, they didn't have the capabilities, so they couldn't do what they are doing now. Now they have the capability, so they're just simply doing what they were not able to do in the past. I think that's a very basic reason. You know, those realists uh, had always been seeking for opportunities to um, uh, create uh, phase of complete. Yeah, and also this disrespect for rules. When we think about the Chinese internal order, it's not supported. The Chinese uh, domestic order is not supported by rule of law but it's supported by the outstanding power of the Chinese Communist Party. So I call it 
Pax Communista. And for some people who envisage a Pax Sinica uh, around China, it's simply an extension of Pax Communista. So if you have the power, if you have the money, you can have your way. And uh, that's the kind of thinking behind all this. And at the same time, uh, they don't mind actually having some friction with the outside world. Some friction with the outside world actually helps them to unite the nation and unite the party, especially when the heat of nationalism is rather high. Yeah, the, the Chinese Communist Party whips up nationalism to unite the nation, to garner support uh, for their regime. That's what they, they've been doing because there's no legitimacy to rule. You know, they are not voted in by the people. Uh, so they uh, are um, always searching for ways to strengthen their legitimacy to, to rule. And before it was uh, mainly developmentalism, you know, by economic development and enhancing the living standards of the people, that was the way they garnered support from the people. But, you know, economics, uh, there are ups and downs. And now the general trend is for the uh, Chinese growth rate to come down, 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 down. So another pillar to support their legitimacy has been uh, nationalism. So in that kind of a situation, uh, it's um, uh, more important to avoid critique from within China. Uh, critique from outside, uh, to some extent, actually helps them. Another factor is the current leader, Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping has a propensity to act, and this is problematic. You know, um, uh, Professor, in the previous session, introduced to us the Hague International Arbitral Tribunal's uh, ruling that came out on July 12 of 2016. And exactly one week after that, somebody said, China's nations, Chinese nation's energy has been suppressed for too long. Let it explode and realize the China dream. And who said this? Of course, it was Xi Jinping. Uh, so for some people, okay, uh, like the fishing department or the oil department, the Coast Guard, the Navy, all right, we heard what the big boss said. So let's uh, show uh, the explosion uh, that he was ta talking about. Uh, maybe that could uh, push them uh, for more action. And another, uh, I will end by this point. Uh, there's a problem in Chinese self-perception. They, I call it the big power syndrome because it exists not only amongst the Chinese, but all the big countries, all the powerful countries, perhaps have this uh, problem in common that they cannot objectively view themselves. Uh, I can cite many examples, but one is the Chinese have started to call their neighborhood diplomacy peripheral diplomacy. So I tell my Chinese friends, this is not a good way to call your neighborhood diplomacy. And they ask me, why, why, what's wrong about calling this peripheral di diplomacy? So I tell them, well, if you say your neighborhood diplomacy is peripheral diplomacy, it implies that you are the center. And they go, oh, you're right, uh, we should change the name. <laughs> but yeah, of course, they have never changed the name. And Xi Jinping often talks about DNA. You know, he likes to speak about the blood of the Chinese nation. The standard phrase is the blood of the Chinese nation does not contain the DNA to invade others and become a hegemon. Whoa, that's very scientific. I mean, non-scientific. <laughs> and don't, don't say that in front of your Vietnamese friends. Uh, but anyhow, that's the self-perception of the Chinese. And apparently, I get the impression that uh, Xi Jinping perhaps believed in this, you know, because uh, he begins, he, after repeating this propaganda, he begins to believe it in, in himself. And another example is Zheng He, uh, or the, the name could be pronounced Chong Ho. Uh, he is the great admiral in the early, early 15th century during the Ming Dynasty. And now the Chinese Communist Party is using him as a symbol of China's peaceful maritime advancement saying that unlike the European colonizers, um, the mission of uh, Zheng He or Chong He was a very peaceful one. He never made anybody a slave. He never took any piece of land and made it a colony. How peaceful, we are peace loving nations. Uh, that kind of narrative, maybe you have heard it before. But actually, if you go to Colombo, Sri Lanka and visit the Sri Lanka National Museum, uh, there is a display saying, we were invaded by Chong He. <laughs> Uh, because Chong Ho's mission 
an important mission was to expand the tributary system of that time. And there was one king on the island of Ceylon who refused uh, to be part of the tributary system. Uh, we are not going to call the Ming Dynasty Emperor our M -M Emperor. And Chongho got angry, very angry, uh, invaded the kingdom, uh, caught the king and his family and took them back to uh, China. So uh, these could be the reasons for uh, China's um, ag aggressive move, uh, moves. Um, but as I was saying in the earlier session, we have to find ways to coexist with China uh, at the same time. So competition and cooperation, this difficult uh, balancing act continues uh, with uh, Japan and all our neighbors except uh, China. So thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Very thorough presentation. Let me now give the floor to Professor Jimbo. Professor. Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for giving me um, another opportunity um, uh, for this session as well. Um, let me also offer my uh, follow-up uh, comments uh, on the uh, East China Sea, South China Sea maritime order. Um, and I, when I look back in the kind of uh, historical context a bit, especially after the Vietnam War, um, you can imagine the map that the northern part of the maritime geography in Asia is in Northeast Asia. And uh, what you can find in the southern part is uh, Southeast Asia. And I think for decades that uh, security, we call it complex, which is the, the domain that we can really have a securitization uh, of the relation with each other, are somewhat, somewhat divided. Uh, because in Northeast Asia, in the Cold War context, we have to deal with the Far East and Russia. Um, divided Korea, uh, so that North Korea uh, 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 has been the problem for a long time, and also divided China, which is the, the mainland China vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Taiwan. Uh, those are the major kind of confrontational relationship uh, that, uh, which is a very based on the geostrategic uh, struggle uh, among those uh, nations or within the nations. Uh, those are uh, quite important. Whereas in the southern part, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you can find more like an internal uh, related uh, issues over the governance, uh, developments, uh, and how they can really struggle uh, for the regional uh, cooperation. Uh, but I think that uh, what really uh, emerged, uh, especially since uh, 1980s and 90s, uh, and according to Professor Hosoya's, uh, you know, uh, statement, that I think that the security domain has what uh, somewhat been more connected uh, with each other because of the couple of uh, reasons. Now, an obvious reason that you can imagine is the rise of China. The rise of China is, uh, you know, is, is for everybody. So uh, that is also uh, the regional uh, effects uh, as well as the global effect. So that the many uh, country have uh, really share uh, the perception uh, that uh, how they can counter the growing uh, military, economic, political influence uh, of China as a common uh, agenda. And the second, I think, uh, you know, uh, what really connects uh, the security complex with each other is the maritime uh, domain. And because the maritime security that connects, um, you know, from the, you know, uh, the European point of view as well, that the connects the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the way into the Suez Canal, the Red Sea, Arabian Sea, um, Indian Ocean, Malacca Strait, South China Sea, and East China Sea, those are well connected uh, with each other in terms of the sea lanes uh, of communication uh, as a, a baseline of the business uh, practices. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the sound safety uh, management of the sea lanes of communication is the fundamental issue uh, for the energy security and, and also for those supply chain uh, and, and the well-being of the everybody's uh, economy. So there has been a growing awareness that, that those kind of connectivity should be uh, well uh, managed. So um, those are uh, the things that uh, I think a regional uh, nation have uh, been focusing upon uh, the, um, uh, you know, those uh, uh, connectivity issues uh, in the maritime uh, order. And uh, also that the stability um, that uh, uh, Professor Takara mentions about the East China Sea and the uh, South China Sea have become uh, the vital uh, interest 
um, uh, for the regional states. And, um, and but uh, however, due to the rapid rise of the Chinese naval power uh, and its activities, uh, the situation uh, in both seas, um, especially since uh, 2010s, have become rapidly deteriorated. So that the everyday uh, issues uh, that we face uh, with the problems in those seas are something uh, related with uh, naval uh, activities uh, by China. And what we also uh, have our concern is the growing gap of capabilities uh, of maritime coast guards, uh, law enforcement agencies uh, and Navy between China vis-a-vis -vis Japan and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Southeast Asian uh, coastal states. And that have created the widening mismatch uh, for maintaining uh, the balance of power. And I, I think we, I, I'm going to talk about next session about the, some layers, but the layers uh, are somewhat, uh, I think, uh, divided into like a low, law enforcement domain where you can see that the role of the uh, Coast Guards um, uh, and, and those law, law enforcement agencies are particularly important, how you can really keep those maritime uh, orders uh, at the sea. But uh, if that situation escalates, uh, the role will be handed over uh, to the navies and somewhat to the Air Force uh, domain. And with those kind of each of those end of uh, the particular domains that the China is getting the superiority vis-a-vis -vis all of the, those neighbors uh, in uh, East China Sea and also in the South China Sea. So that uh, those kind of, uh, you know, status quo management have become the critically uh, important uh, issue uh, to be concerned. So how, how do we deal with those capability is particularly uh, to our uh, concern. And secondly, uh, whether those kind of diplomatic efforts creating those um, um, status quo management uh, agreements could be possible. Um, Takara Sensei well mentioned about the 2010, 2012 uh, disputes. And this is a fundamentally a zero sum issues because of the both sides are claiming uh, the sovereign rights over the particular uh, territory. Um, but uh, somewhat that uh, what we have learned so far uh, is that it is very hard to uh, kind of reach to the fundamental solution uh, over those issues because uh, China basically uh, doesn't really agree uh, to put on the table into the international um, dispute settlement mechanisms. Uh, for example, in the uh, arbitration rule uh, court ruling, uh, which Philippine has made uh, the well advanced uh, kind of uh, you know this, uh, the arrangement mechanism over those arbitration tribunal, but the Chinese response is that this is a piece of paper that uh, China does not uh, need to um, uh, abide by, uh, and also uh, we uh, have a, a pessimistic prospect that the, such kind of a multilateral uh, or institutional settlement could be uh, made possible for uh, the East China Sea. But we are not really giving up uh, because that uh, at least that the crisis management mechanism could be possible so that the each end of those uh, mar uh, maritime safety agency, the Chinese Coast Guard is, uh, you know, uh, maintaining uh, the communication uh, connections in order to avoid the unnecessary crash uh, over uh, sea so that uh, those kind of communication mechanisms uh, have been formally established between Japan uh, and China. And at the political level, uh, there has been the confidence building uh, has been uh, taking place uh, regularly through the dialogues. And what is at stake very interestingly is that uh, uh, there has been somewhat uh, the, what um, East Asian type of solution uh, since like a Shanghai communique, how, how, how they can really deal with Taiwan. Obviously this is the core issue of China, but uh, how United States and China could communicate uh, over those issues over Shanghai uh, communique in 1972 uh, is that there is a one China, but there is a different interpretation over how they can deal with the concept of the one China. Similarly, that East China Sea, there is a Senkaku on, on our side and Diao Yutao on, on the other. But what we have came up in the October 2014 um, uh, through those um, uh, two diplomatic channel uh, is that the, we, we basically identify this as a problem, uh, but uh, you know, uh, to agree upon that uh, each side has a different perception uh, over uh, those issues. And, and it's a face saving efforts. It, it doesn't solve any, anything about the legal uh, you know, status of uh, the issue, but at least that uh, you know, cross recognizing of this is the problem, 
and we recognize uh, that we, we, we know that there are differences on, the, on the, those perception, at least for a time being, that, that, uh, that really works uh, for at least to create the environment that each side can uh, continue our dialogue and uh, not really let uh, those, uh, you know, sudden change of the status quo by force uh, in the, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the we, we cannot really take for granted all over those uh, conditions, but at least that we can really, uh, you know, maintain uh, those kind of status quo uh, management uh, over those issues. And finally, uh, what we see uh, as another aspect is the role of the United States on this uh, maritime security, because uh, the United States is uh, the uh, most important uh, military player. Uh, I mean, the military uh, domain, uh, um, you, you know, the the, um, uh, the security provider uh, of these issues. And, and Japan, um, Korea, Philippines are the, uh, you know, the treaty allies uh, of the United States. And basically that what United States tried to provide the security uh, umbrella uh, over, uh, especially on the, the uh, escalation management, uh, whether they can cross the red line uh, over the sovereignty uh, of the Senkaku. United States have been made it clear that uh, Article 5, which is, uh, you know, United Security Guarantee over the treaty commitment will apply uh, to the uh, the case of Senkaku. And that kind of message could be uh, well addressed to the Chinese uh, leadership. And the recently that the uh, United States also have upgraded uh, their commitment uh, towards the South China Sea, especially for the Philippine uh, claimed uh, territorial uh, kind, of, kind of claim in South China Sea. And the uh, United States doesn't really specify which, uh, uh, which uh, you know, the islands uh, can be recognized by uh, the United States over those uh, issues because uh, the fundamentally that the United States doesn't really take a size uh, on the, those uh, uh, sovereign uh, territorial claims issue. But uh, if uh, the Philippine forces uh, have been attacked uh, by, you know, supposedly by China, uh, in the South China Sea, uh, the United States uh, will apply uh, the, the mutual defense uh, commitments uh, to the Philippines. So, so those kind of escalation management mechanisms have also been the very important, uh, I think, the, uh, you know, uh, the reference uh, for Chinese leadership, how they can really manage uh, the order uh, in these issues. So those are my uh, follow-up comments uh, to my uh, Greece uh, colleagues about uh, what is at stake uh, in East China Sea and South China Sea. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, give the floor now to Professor Verlan. This is not my presentation. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you and to have colleagues joining us from Japan. Thank you very much to the Japanese Embassy and thank you to the University for putting this event together. My contribution will be on maritime security in the South China Sea, and I will try to examine the role of China from a legal perspective, but also from a, a practical policy-oriented perspective in order to try and understand how China has been destabilizing the efforts uh, of the countries in the region and the international community to enhance maritime security in the region. Maritime security um, is a buzzword, is a concept that we have been using in international relations, in politics, in the field of law, but we haven't agreed yet on what it means. It has no fixed definition. And we all agree now that the concept means different things to different people across time and space. So in order to get a sense of what maritime security means for the states in the South China Sea, I think the first thing that we have to do is to have a look at the work of the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And if one looks at their strategy and their plans, we will see that they haven't agreed on a definition either. They use the term in a very broad way, and it encompasses a lot of activities and threats. Some of these threats include interstate disputes because of the limitation issues, cross-border crimes, risks to the environment, and issues around illegal fishing and fisheries management. 
The priority areas for the countries, for the ASEAN countries, have been on uh, shared awareness and exchange of information and best practices, confidence building measures on the basis of UNCLUS, and uh, investment in uh, capacity building and enhanced cooperation of maritime law enforcement agencies. And I think Professor Jindo has already said how important it is to have effective uh, law enforcement in order to enhance maritime security. Other states have interests as well. Uh, the literature refers to them as user states. And various states, again, have diverse interests. The United States, for example, has been very keen to safeguard the freedom of navigation. They've been investing in naval operations in the region. These include counterterrorism operations through the Proliferation Security Initiative. And on that front, they have found support from Japan, which has been supporting the counterterrorism operations. But Japan itself has great interests in safeguarding the sea lanes. And this is not surprising, because the majority of oil and other goods that are being transported to Japan, they are being transported through the sea lanes of the of South China Sea. So Japan has a great interest in protecting these sea lanes. And Japanese vessels have also been attacked by pirates in the region, so it's important to safeguard these interests. Australia, on the other hand, through its policies, has been placing emphasis on safeguarding the territorial integrity of states in the region from regional and extra-regional threats. And this, of course, uh, makes note of the Chinese behavior, but also of other uh, threats originating from non-state actors. And finally, another country that has emerged as a very important player in the maritime security of the region is India through its Look East policy. It has been trying to build partnerships with countries in the region and has been investing um, in maritime security in the region. Of course, we could mention other states here. We could mention Greece. Greece, we, we said that many times, we're far from the South China Sea, but at the same time, Greece is one of the strongest maritime nations. There are a lot, a lot of uh, vessels of Greek interests. They might fly flags of different countries, but there are flags, uh, there are vessels of Greek interests uh, that navigate through these waters on a daily basis. So again, the protection of the sea lanes and maritime security in the region is vital for the Greek interests as well. So what are the problems with China? There are quite a few problems with the Chinese actions in the South China Sea, uh, and they are all problematic if we examine them uh, with the lens of, uh, of Anclozon. So one of the issues has been with the Paracel Islands. Professor Takahara has mentioned the Paracel Islands. The straight baselines around the islands and the claims, the, the sovereign right claims and jurisdiction claims of China are incompatible with UNCLOS. UNCLOS mentions straight baselines, but the straight baselines are an exception to the rule of the normal baselines. The practice of China also resembles what UNCLOS allows only archipelagic states to do, and China, of course, is not an archipelagic state. Other issues arise from the use of the nine dash line that again has been mentioned. China makes claims on the basis of historic rights and they've been claiming fishing rights, navigation rights and priority rights of resource development. Again, these practices are incompatible with UNCLUS. UNCLUS introduced a zonal approach system that was aimed at superseding historic claims. So these historic rights, these historic claims have no legal basis on the basis of what ANCLO says. The other issue is with the Spartley Islands that again have been mentioned. Uh, China has been uh, constructing artificial islands uh, in an effort to make EZ claims, claims which of course encroach upon the sovereignty of the states in the region. Again, this practice is incompatible with Article 121 of UNCLOS. The article was not very clear. It is true that it wasn't entirely clear what an island and what a rock is under the convention. But this has now been clarified by the tribunal in the South China Sea arbitration, where the tribunal explained that islands have to sustain human uh, living, human habitation, and economic development of their own. So the practices of dredging and construction of artificial islands is not 
compatible with Article 101. These islands, these pictures cannot be considered islands. But of course, and as Professor Jimbo said, for China, this decision has been a piece of paper. They did not participate in the proceedings and they do not accept the decision. Uh, and of course, this raises problems not only with the interpretation and application of UNCLOS, but with the system, the dispute uh, uh, settlement mechanism that was introduced by UNCLOS. Finally, there are problems with the freedom of navigation. China has introduced law that uh, restricts the right of innocent passage to warships. It does the same with freedom of navigation in the EZ. Uh, it says that prior permission or identification is required. Again, these are not in UNCLOS. Articles 18 and 19 safeguard the right of innocent passage. And of course, Article 58 refers to Article 87 of UNCLOS and says that freedom of navigation applies in the EZ as it applies on the high seas. Same restrictions apply to overflight of the EZ, and of course China has been very strict when it comes to intelligence gathering or the collection of other information within their EZ. Again, it is true that UNCLOS is a bit vague when it comes to military activities uh, in the EZ of third states, but I think after all these years that we've been debating this, it has been agreed that again on the basis of, the art of Article 58, uh, military activities are allowed in the EZ of third states. So what are the problems in practice? In practice, we've seen that there are some key elements in achieving a successful maritime security strategy, in realizing maritime security in practice. What is required is compliance with the rule of law and UNCLOS, Successful maritime domain awareness, and for those who are not familiar with the term, by maritime domain awareness activities, we mean activities that have to do with the collection of information for the unlawful activities of vessels, uh, criminal gangs, and other non-state actors. So it's, it's information that we collect in order to understand what criminals do and not what states do. So uh, maritime domain awareness is not meant to challenge national security in any way. Controls and intergovernmental cooperation. And the problems that we see here is that the Chinese actions challenge all of these. In relation to uh, UNCLOS, for example, I have already said how they challenge UNCLOS. But what's more interesting is that they follow a very inconsistent interpretation of UNCLOS on the basis of their interests. So to give you an example, um, at the beginning of March, uh, a report by the House of Lords, the International Defense Committee of the, of the House of Lords was published. It examined the issue of UNCLOS and among other issues, it invited evidence regarding the Chinese actions in the, China, uh, the South China Sea and the interpretation of UNCLOS. And what it was noted was that the Ch Chinese warships have participated in, in naval operations in the Arctic with Russia. And in order to do so, they have crossed the English Channel on multiple occasions. So the Chinese exercise the rights that they have under UNCLOS, but when it comes to the South China Sea, they refuse to interpret UNCLOS in the same way. And of course, this inconsistent interpretation of UNCLOS challenges the efforts of states to improve maritime security on the basis of the rule of law. The other issues have to do that the Chinese actions create a lot of suspicion. Uh, they challenge the efforts of states in the region to cooperate. Since China, China doesn't want collection of information in the EZ, the other states do not want other warships to collect information in the EZ either. So the efforts to improve maritime domain awareness is being undermined. The same happens with coordinated patrols and naval operations. Um, there are, of course, joint efforts, but states, especially coastal states, they don't want to cooperate with China because they don't want Chinese warships in their EZs. And again, this becomes a problem when it comes to tackling th threats such as maritime terrorism, piracy. You need support. States in the region need support. They have to improve their capacity building. And sometimes they have to cooperate with China, something that they don't want to do. 
Of course, there have been a number of interstate incidents, and again, Professor Jimbo mentioned the problem with the US, and Professor Takahara did the same. There have been various incidents where force was used, uh, and again, this undermines the joint efforts for cooperation. So very briefly, just to conclude, what should be done, what could be done going forward? States have to continue to emphasize the application of UNCLOS to the South China Sea, whether China likes it or not. UNCLOS applies to the South China Sea exactly in the same way that it does to other oceans around the world. They should continue to exercise the right of freedom and they should continue to invest in maritime domain awareness and support capacity building. Because only if we have effective patrols, effective law enforcement agencies, only this way maritime security will be achieved in the region and the interests both of the coastal states and the user states will be safeguarded. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this very informative presentation. Give the floor to Professor Simonis. Hello, uh, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Pantheon University, uh, His Excellency the Ambassador of Japan in Athens for this kind invitation. I'm also very humbled to, to be in the same panel, even virtually, with fellow Chinese studies uh, scholars, uh, whom I know very well from the literature. Now, in my short contribution uh, to our discussion today, I will focus on emotions, and in particular, the politics of emotions and their implications in regional uh, stability. Now, the, the Sino-Japanese relation is complex because it combines uh, rationality and emotion. Broadly, we can identify uh, economic interdependence and the various geopolitical and security concerns as the more kind of rational aspects. And then we have the politics of emotions, the third and key factor, where we have nationalism, of course, a very heightened xenophobic version of nationalism in China, but also the manipulation of feelings of the Chinese population around uh, history and around uh, the, the trauma of Japanese imperialism. And I'm going to, uh, to argue that the politics of emotions in China uh, are the key factor that limit any prospects for permanent resolution of the differences between the two nations. So uh, I'm not going to expand on the two key uh, rational factors, economic interdependence and security, because uh, the distinguished colleagues from, uh, from Japan have already um, mentioned them. I just want to, sh to emphasize that Japan has really been hand in hand with China when it comes to its uh, economic growth and its economic uh, policies since uh, the very steps, the very first steps uh, of, uh, of its open door policy, right? It was, it was first Chinese diaspora and then the Japanese that went into China and invested. And also Japan uh, had a very constructive kind of attitude during the WTO uh, negotiations. It was the first uh, country that uh, signed the bilateral agreement uh, with China. So it has uh, promoted and of course, as Professor Takahara mentioned, has benefited from that. Now, China and Japan are the engines of economic uh, growth in East Asia. And they are the key contributing factor to region, regionalization, okay? to the creation, to the integration, to the economic integration of East Asia. Now, they, from the geopolitical side of view, we have, of course, the so-called hub and spoke system of security, US in the middle as the hub and the spokes with different countries, primarily, of course, with, with Japan and Korea. There is also the issue of Japan's normalization that will become even uh, uh, more prevalent in the future as there is growing pressure for Japan to assume more responsibility for uh, its own and for regional security. Now, so what... So the sum of these two uh, uh, rational kind of factors is that we, we have uh, uh, a very, very, very uh, rapid uh, regionalization, but very weak 
regionalism. So we have a lot of business going on. We have very few kind of institutional arrangements uh, going on. So let's turn to the politics of emotions. Now, the pol there is a growing literature in international relations on, on emotions, uh, how they impact perception, policy making, and behavior, uh, how they are exploited, manipulated by political actors, uh, but also how they take a life uh, of their own. Now, the case of the Chinese Communist Party, and I'm referring to the Chinese Communist Party because I think that's the, the analytical uh, uh, point, that's the analytical actor here, not, not China in general. So the case of the Chinese Communist Party is very characteristic of its use of emotional obligations and entitlements to frame um, uh, its interests in East Asia. Now, I do not, I do not refer here simple, simply to the manipulation um, of nationalism, but the establishment of emotional frames both for policymakers and for the public on how they make sense of, uh, of development. Now, this, of course, goes back to the 1980s, to the end, to, to the real collapse of communism uh, in China uh, with the rise of Deng Xiaoping, where we have a completely new uh, paradigm. Uh, and as part of this transformation, as part of the end of the communist revolution in China, was, of course, the turn to nationalism. Uh, for legitimacy. Now, since then, we have uh, an emphasis uh, on uh, the century of humiliation. Okay? China repeats through its education system the experience of the 100 years of humiliation. It uses memory to export its domestic problems uh, through scapegoating and tactical victimization. Um, and it's very characteristic that every time China undergoes a crisis, there is uh, a foreign power or powers uh, to blame. Now, we also have an interesting distinction in the literature between state patriotism, or you could say state nationalism, and popular nationalism. So the state has a certain kind of narrative and discourse, but this ends up with the public. It takes life of its own. It becomes um, a force that, can, that even the state cannot uh, easily control. Now, both versions, both of, of what the state says and how this, uh, the public perceives it, uh, have become way more uh, xenophobic under Xi Jinping. Now, Taiwan, the South China Sea, the East China Sea, there are very different problems, but they share this commonality of, of having acquired an emotion, a high emotional load for the Chinese people. And of course, Japan is singled out because there is a well-embedded frame of anti-Japanese that perpetuates uh, victimization and animosity. Now, central to that, of course, is World War II. Now, what, what, what I find very interesting is that actually China forgot about the war crimes of Japan uh, during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mao Zedong was very uh, keen on not uh, talking about these things, exactly because he didn't want to antagonize also Japan in the Cold War uh, context. So really, China had forgotten, uh, broadly forgotten, about what, went, uh, what, what happened in World War II. Now, the crimes of Japanese militarism are, of course, well documented. Uh, but we see, uh, especially since the 1980s, where uh, nationalism replaces communist as ideology, we see a heightened emphasis on, on Japan as the arch enemy. And of course, by association of the Chinese Communist Party as the savior. Now, the, it is very interesting, uh, until recently, uh, Chinese school children would learn about the eight-year war of resistance against Japan. 1937 with the Marco Polo uh, Bridge incident until 1945. But Xi Jinping, in the last uh, years, changed that from 80 years to 14 years. So now uh, Chinese school children, school children uh, uh, learn about the 14-year uh, resistance against Japan, adding another six years, essentially in the 30s, to cover uh, uh, e events that had actually very little to do uh, with resisting Japan. It had a lot to do with uh, the Chinese Communist Party's own kind of history and struggle for survival. Now, uh, and of course, it has uh, heightened, it has overemphasized uh, its own role 
in, the in World War II, okay, in, in the resistance against Japan. Now, the Chinese Communist Party fought Japanese uh, occupying forces. However, the real fight uh, was made by the government of China, by the Nationalist Party. Okay? That's who really fought, tried to, to fight Japan and paid the price for it. Now, uh, this rediscovery uh, so involves bla blatant uh, rewriting uh, of history. Now, what we have is uh, a very strong anti-Japanese uh, propaganda in school and media. This is, for, we have a Greek audience. This is uh, way, uh, this is much different than what we have towards Turkey, what we learned towards, uh, about our history with Turkey, right? Um, so just to give you a few examples, a few images, the first is um, uh, a storybook for children. Uh, so it's the story about this uh, young, uh, young uh, Chinese boy and how he resisted Japan. The second is one of the recent school books uh, that expand this eight-year war into 14-year war against Japan. Then we have various kung fu movies that, of course, you have the, 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 the Chinese kind of uh, kung fu uh, artist uh, fighting uh, Japanese soldiers. Now, all these... Um, um, all these add up. Um, when I spent six years in China, and I was, I, I can definitely tell you that if uh, if you were watching TV at any time of the day, there would be at least one documentary about uh, Japan's war crimes every day. Now this, of course, adds up. And what happens is that when we have any kind of tensions or differences, there is a, a massive uh, populist reaction. There is a massive reaction by the public. Now, uh, the prospects uh, in this situation are, of course, uh, I, I share the pessimism that Professor uh, Jimbo uh, has. Uh, the CCP has cultivated emotions that cannot be controlled. Uh, they have acquired a life of their own. Um, and so the communists have to live by the problematic narrative they have created. Now, uh, there, is a, uh, there is this uh, very strong anti-Japanese feeling that creates pressure on Japan to constantly apologize. You know, uh, the Japanese government uh, has apologized, I don't know how many, dozens of times about, its, uh, about what happened in World War II, but there is a constant demand from China and also from, uh, from Korea for uh, uh, apology, uh, over apology, and more um, kinds of practical ways to demonstrate that. Um, and this has created a backlash in Japan, where there is not a, not a you couldn't say a mainstream or a majority, but there is a, a growing kind of feeling that, okay, we have apologized enough, we need, we need to, uh, to move forward. So the central problem is that the politics of emotions in China limits space uh, for maneuvering, uh, and actually li limit the space for maneuvering f of, the, of, the, of the government of the People's Republic. Okay. So uh, there is very limited space for negotiation, resolution through arbitration, judicial process, or any court ruling or settlement, or any form of mutual compromise. Okay. The CCP simply cannot, uh, cannot, um, uh, cannot compromise because of the emotional frame it, it has created itself around these issues. So the prospects favor the delegate status quo, but very important dilemmas remain. Should Japan take more responsibility for security, for its security, and what will happen then? What will be the reaction from China? Uh, can they, can, how long can the Chinese Communist Party uh, continue living with this unresolved, but, but very emotionally um, uh, heightened kind of uh, issues? Um, in its neighborhood. So that's all for me, and thank you for listening. Thank you for the very informative talk. And now the, the floor is, give the floor to Adrian Jacob. Thank you very much. The, the beauty of being the last in the panel is that first, most of what we want to say has been said already, so you don't have to repeat yourself or the others. Second, you don't have much time, <laughs> so I would be brief. And uh, I want to say that there are many components in uh, 
this China policy in the South China Sea, many dimensions, I would call them. Most of them have been addressed already. There is a domestic policy dimension. There is an economic dimension regarding uh, the energy resources and the needs, the huge needs of China and China's economy for these resources. Yes, but there is a strategic dimension and the geopolitical dimension. And in my previous intervention, I made this connection about what happens in Eastern Mediterranean and the South China Sea. They are not that far away. We're in an interconnected world. The goods from the South China Sea come to Europe through Eastern Mediterranean. The way the China and Turkey behaves have many similarities. The way they, be, they believe that they are encircled by enemies or by other states that uh, want to diminish them have the same, uh, uh, have the same, uh, let's say, quality. And the way the countries in the area perceive these heavy-handed tactics, these bullying tactics, have similarities. What China wants to do in the South China Sea, to me, on the strategic level, is an area denial uh, concept. They want to have an area denial, a control of the sea, that will, this way they, they react and they resist to freedom of navigation operations. They want to, the United States and the other navies to stay away, so they would have ultimately control in the whole area. And they need this ultimately control of the whole area because this is in, intrinsically linked with their uh, the, the, their plans for Taiwan. So South China Sea, Taiwan, and, and Japan, which they believe it's their structural adversary in the area, are all of them very well interlinked. Now, Professor Takahara said something in the previous panel that, you know, you have many problems with your neighbor, but you're destined to live together. I agree completely. With your neighbor, you have problems, we cannot have problems, I mean, Greece cannot have problems with Costa Rica even, even if we wanted to. But you have common interests with your neighbor. And this, this, the fact that we're destined to live together is like a marriage. But as we know from the real life, marriages are very often unhappy marriages. And marriages are unhappy marriages when the one part is abusive. What we see there is the abuse of the international law and the law of the seas. And the only way a marriage or any coexistence in the society or the society of nations is through the common adherence in common values. And these values are written in the law of the seas. Thank you very much. Thank the Admiral for this very concise, you to, the, to you the point. You didn't let me much time, uh, <laughs> Well, you could have gone a little over, but anyway. Are there any questions? Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, do you believe that with further enhancing the cooperation in the uh, maritime economic sector between Japan and China, this could improve or solve the territorial disputes and tension between those countries. Could this happen likewise in uh, Turkey and Greece? Thank you. Should I give it a try? Uh, well, personally, I don't think that China has any intention of changing its approach to the South China Sea or giving up its claims in South China Sea. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by cooperation in the maritime economic sector. Well, e those economic two cooperation is, yeah, is different. It might happen, it happens. It might happen even more, but I don't think that this will change the behavior of China in the South China Sea. And I think very recently, after the last meeting between our Prime Minister 
and the Turkish president, there were discussions about economic agreements and partnerships and cooperation. Again, I'm not entirely convinced that this will change the behavior of Turkey and the claims that they've been making in the GNC. I mean, they might improve cooperation, bilateral dialogue, and reduce the tensions, but I don't think that this will be um, something that will make either country to give up their claims on territorial issues. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, maybe afterwards, I really like to know the opinion of Professor Takahara and Professor Jimbo on these issues because they are experts on that. But before that, I like to just add one point. 2008, uh, between Japanese government and the Chinese government, we agreed very important on very important document, which is called mutual beneficial relationship based on common strategic interest, and based upon that agreement. Both sides need to rely on international relations, international law or agreements to solve differences. This is one thing. And also, we both, Japan and China, agreed to jointly develop natural resources in East China Sea. But unilaterally, China abandoned it. In December 2008, Chinese government dispatched public vessels to the territorial waters of the Senkaku Island on the con con contiguous waters of territory Ireland, and since afterwards, Chinese government unilaterally abandoned uh, the cooperation uh, jointly to jointly develop natural resources there. So it's China who abandoned the cooperation on common economic interests. And afterwards, the Japanese government has been repeatedly asked, requested Chinese government to come back to the original position of the agreement between the two sides to maintain peace and stability in the region. And to some extent, I think that China responded. But once again, particularly since 2010, uh, we have experienced a very tense relationship. So I think that it is very difficult for China, uh, China for, for several reasons, to protect, to, to respect these agreements, mainly because of domestic Chinese problems or uh, some of the politics within the Chinese Communist Party. So I think that, uh, well, this is exactly uh, both Professor Takahara and Professor Jimbo are very familiar with. So they will maybe answer to this question. OK, if uh, Professors Takahara and Jimbo want to add something. Um, I think uh, Jose sensei has uh, described it very well. The 2008 ag agreement is very important. So in the future, Hopefully, uh, the next leader, perhaps, of China can come back to that. Uh, but let me just uh, briefly tell you about a very interesting experience between Japan and China in the Bohai Sea that is next to uh, Beijing and Tianjin. Uh, for over 10 years, Japan and China had a joint venture uh, drilling for oil. And unfortunately, uh, commercially, it was a failure. Uh, and the Japanese side uh, abandoned the project and the Japanese companies that had invested in it um, pulled out. And the Americans moved in. And the Americans actually succeeded in finding a commercially viable uh, oil um, uh, bed. So uh, now Bohai is one of the, um, the producing uh, area of oil in, in China. But if the Japanese side had succeeded together with the Chinese, the situation could be very different. Uh, but that did not happen, and here we are. And um, for, for me, um, I do agree with uh, both professors, and I have nothing to add. So I think we can start the third session. First of all, thank you very much for coming to this room. It's a long day, but this is the third and final session. We will focus on Greece-Japan cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, Japan, Greece, uh, Japan, Greece cooperation towards a free and open maritime order. This is a kind of, a, a, from a point of view, a wrap-up session at the end of today's event, and we will focus on how we can cooperate each other because both of us, Japan and Greece, have our own respective problems, maritime uh, disputes in Eastern Mediterranean and East Asia. And we need to defend our own territory, territory and the territories and the interests respectively 
in a peaceful measures. So maybe we can learn each other from showing our own experiences. And in this session, we have four speakers. I'm Ichio Soya, Professor of International Politics at Keio University. I am moderator of the third session. And we have four excellent speakers in this session. And in the beginning, I'd like to ask uh, Minister Angelos Shirigos, because he needs to leave this room uh, around quarter to one. So if, at first, I'd like to ask him to talk, and then uh, we like to, I, I'd like to collect some questions and uh, comments soon after his speech, and then we move to the next speaker, the next three speakers, to uh, deepen our discussion. So may I ask uh, Professor Shirigos to start your talk, please? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, do I have a pointer? Is there any pointer? There is a pointer. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for, I would like to thank the Japanese Embassy for having this initiative. It is, uh, we have started this some years ago, some four or five years ago. We had to stop due to COVID-19 and I'm very glad that we can continue. And uh, since yesterday you had an earthquake in uh, Japan with four victims, may I express uh, my condolences and my thoughts to the people uh, in Japan. Uh, we have the same problem in Greece with earthquakes, so it is something uh, that attracts our interest and uh, we hope the best for your people. Uh, I'm going to speak about, sorry for two minutes in Greek. I'm very happy to be able to speak about the last two months, the last few 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 months, the last We are going to speak about the delimitation of maritime zones in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, I'm going to start with the limits of the Greek maritime zones. Okay. Uh, where there is the dotted line, over here and over there, there is a delimitation agreement. This is the delimitation agreement between Italy of 1977, which was followed by a second delimitation agreement in 2020. Greece and Italy delimited in 1977 the continental shelf of the two countries and in 2020 the exclusive economic zone and we have another delimitation agreement between Greece and Egypt in 2020 the rest of the boundary between uh, Greece and, and its neighboring states follows the median line the median line because there is no agreement between Greece and the relevant countries. The only place where it does not follow the median line is over here because there is a delimitation agreement between Greece and Egypt. So it goes up to the north to the terrestrial frontier between Greece and Turkey. And these are the limits of uh, the Cypriot EZ. By the way, if you noticed, I spoke about Greek maritime zones, because in certain areas, for example, over here, we have uh, an exclusive economic zone, and we have an exclusive economic zone in the Ionian Sea. In the rest of the area, we have only continental shelf. That's why I spoke about maritime zones in general. In the case of Cyprus, we have an exclusive economic zone and uh, the boundary of these, the limits of this exclusive economic zone is consisted by three agreements. The first agreement was between Cyprus and Egypt in 2003. It is this agreement. There was a second agreement between Cyprus and Lebanon over here in 2007 and the third agreement between Cyprus and Israel in 2010. The rest of the line follows the median line since there is no agreement in the area. So this is the map of the limits of the Greek 
continental shelf and TEZ and the Cypriot EZ all together. Now we are going to see how Turkish claims developed since 1973. 1973 was the first time that Turkey claimed that part of the Greek continental shelf in the Aegean Sea uh, belonged to Turkey. These are these grey areas over here around uh, in the northern Aegean and in the area between the Cyclades Islands and the Dodecanese group of islands. Uh, these claims have been repeated in 1987. It was the first time that Turkey laid, laid, laid claims on Turkish, on the uh, Greek continental shelf. But this applied only in the Aegean Sea. In 2004, Turkey sent a letter to the United Nations which said that they claim the area which is beyond Meridian 32-16, to the west of the island of Cyprus. They didn't say the exact limits of this area. They said that the area to the west of this meridian belongs to Turkey. In 2009, they laid another claim. This is this uh, red area. It is just uh, in the area where Greek uh, continental shelf and Cypriot EZ meet. And it covers part of the Turkish continental shelf as well. That was in 2009. In 2011, we have a so-called delimitation agreement between Turkey and the occupied part of Cyprus. It is a funny thing because Turkey signed an agreement with itself because it occupies the northern part. There was no discussion, there was no negotiation. It was just the agreement. And they claimed that, you can see this red line, this red line represents the so-called limit of uh, the agreement between Turkey and the occupied part of Cyprus. In 2012, Turkey laid another claim. They said, they said that the whole of this area to the west of Meridian, to the east of Meridian 28, up to Meridian 32, belongs to Turkey. That took place for the first time in 2012. And then in 2020, Turkey submitted a map on the 23rd of March 2020, actually these days, uh, two years ago, and they claim that all this area belongs to the Turkish continental shelf. These are the official claims. Nevertheless, Turkey supports the so-called Blue Homeland Doctrine, Mavi Vatan, which, according to which, the limits are a bit expanded. You can see that it covers half of the Aegean Sea. It goes southwest of the island of Crete. And of course, it covers the rest of the area that has been claimed by Turkey since 2004, 2009, 2011, and 2012. We can see all the claims of Turkey together in this map in the Blue Homeland Doctrine. And actually, this is a panorama of the official Turkish claims in the Eastern Mediterranean. This one is a doctrine. That one, this one, this map represents the official claims back in 1973 and 1974, and the rest in the second decade, decade of 2010. Now, let us see which are the Turkish proposals for maritime delimitations in the East uh, Med. Uh, back in 2011, a Turkish um, admiral presented these maps. These maps uh, showed 
the possible agreement between Turkey and Egypt. But there is a problem. There is already an agreement between Cyprus and Egypt. So what Turkey proposed is that Egypt is going to consider this agreement with Cyprus as null and void, and it's going, it will sign a new agreement with Turkey, which will follow the median line between the Turkish mainland and the Egyptian mainland. What Turkey suggested to Egypt was that if you agree to what we are saying, then you are going to get all these areas with yellow, which now are part of Cyprus according to the delimitation agreement you signed with Cyprus. The same applied with Turkey and Israel. Uh, the, the green line over here is the delimitation agreement between Cyprus and Israel. Turkey said that, look, we are going to sign a new agreement. The opposite coast is that coast because in the delimitation, the law of delimitation agreements, you, you must find which is the opposite coast. So they found that the opposite coast was a bit far away, but doesn't matter as long as it is the opposite coast. And the median line over here was going to offer all these areas which, according to the agreement between Cyprus and uh, Israel, belonged to Israel, then it would have belonged, uh, sorry, they belonged to Cyprus. If an agreement would, was going to be signed between Turkey and Israel, then these areas were going to belong to Israel. The same idea was with the agreement between, um, uh, Turkey and, uh, between Cyprus and Lebanon. This is the green line of the agreement. But uh, what happened in reality was that we had a problem here. The opposite coast was just above uh, the island of Cyprus. But nevertheless, they jumped over the island of Cyprus and they said this is the opposite coast. And uh, then, uh, therefore, Lebanon, if you consider the agreement with Cyprus as null and void, then you are going to gain the area in yellow over here. The most interesting uh, map among these maps was this map that was presented and did not make any sense back in 2011. But it made, well, what Turkey did here was they proposed to Libya to sign an agreement. This is the median line of the agreement between Turkey and Libya, which means that Libya is going to win 39,000 square kilometers, which, if an agreement between Greece and Libya was going to be signed, it would have belonged to Greece. We saw the map with Petros Liakouras, and we laughed by that time. You remember Petros? We said, oh my God, <laughs> they're exceeding beyond any limits. But... Uh, it seems that uh, this map took place in uh, 2019 when a Turkish Libyan Memorandum of Understanding was signed. And actually, this is the limit over here. It is the limit over here in the map. So, what is the Turkish idea of uh, delimitation agreements? we can see the agreement within brackets between Turkey and the Turkish occupied part of Cyprus. Uh, the blue line is the median line between Turkey and Cyprus. Cyprus is an independent state. It is a very big island. It is an island state. It is a very big state. It has one million inhabitants. Nevertheless, in the agreement that has been signed between Turkey and uh, itself, herself, the agreement did not follow the median line. In certain areas, it was more than one-third uh, to the detriment of uh, Cyprus. 
This is the limit of the Turkish Libyan MOU. You can see where it is in the map. It is within the Greek continental shelf. And to be honest, this MOU may have some validity if the geography of the area was like this. That means we didn't have any islands in the area. In that case, we may have said that it has some validity. We can discuss it. But geography is not like this. And geography is the most important factor in the limitation agreements. There is a Greek-Egyptian uh, Greek maritime delimitation agreement. It has been signed in 2020. It is this line over here. And you can see the comparison between the limits of the Turkish Libyan MOU and the boundary of the maritime delimitation agreement between Greece and Egypt. It is, if we take the map that has been submitted to the United Nations in um, March 2020, we can see that the area that has been delimited between Greece and Egypt falls partly in the area claimed by Turkey. You can see the area over here. Well, I spoke for 15 minutes. I am at your disposal for any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Minister Shirigos, for your uh, clear and uh, comprehensive uh, talk, uh, speech about uh, Greek uh, agreement with surrounding country as well as difficult relationship with neighboring countries. So I like to collect uh, some questions and uh, comments to uh, Minister Shigo's speech because he needs to leave this room until uh, uh, the quarter to one. So do you, if uh, any question, you have any question or comments, please raise your hand. And one question, yes please, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do you suggest that this Turkey's uh, claim, what Turkey's Turk claim, uh, is a is a clear uh, threat to our our interests? What, what I'm saying is, it, it is against international law of the sea. And well, <laughs> very simply like this: uh, if we can see the map again, uh, if we can. Uh, very simply, geography is not like this. The area is full of islands. Uh, we cannot say that the islands did not, do not exist. They do exist. And we're speaking about big islands. The island of Crete over here is the fifth largest island of the Mediterranean Sea. The island of Rhodes over here is the ninth largest island of the Mediterranean Sea, both in terms of uh, population as well as in terms of um, size. We cannot say that these islands do not exist and the map is like this. It is an empty, empty map. So what I'm saying is that Turkey does, uh, does all these things against basic principles of international law of the sea. Uh, okay, Angelos, thank you very much for the presentation. And of course, we have to show also the contradictions on behalf of Turkey with these maritime delimitations according to, to its uh, perceptions about this. First of all, yes, it is true, it is true that Turkey does not take in, into account in the delimitation process the islands at all. That's why they say Castellorizo, Castellorizo, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Castellorizo is some 
how 460 nautical miles from uh, Peloponnese. So they don't take into consideration at all the closest island, which is Rhodes, which is 68 nautical miles. That's the first one. The second one, which is very important, and you mentioned it, uh, is when going to the perception of Turkey with regard to Cyprus, it says to the west, that means the Republic of Cyprus, Cyprus has no entitlement to continental self. To the north, where it is the occupied areas, the so-called Turkish Republic and so on, there it recognizes not full effect, but a partial effect, which is more than 50% of the effect. So this is a clear contradiction that according to its profits, okay, islands have have entitlements and have also effect. But where Turkey is not interested, there is no at all. I mean, this is a contradiction. And of course, if it is a contradiction, it runs counter to the law of the sea from the beginning. Well, of course, I totally agree. Uh, in this case, the important, you spoke before about Peloponnese. Peloponnese is this peninsula to the south of Greece. I was wondering whether Turkey considered that Peloponnese is an island <laughs> since, since it has been cut from the rest of, uh, uh, the, main, of uh, the mainland for more than 100 years ago. And therefore, it does not lay any claims on any maritime zones according to Turkey's, Turkey's perception of international law. And in that case, we may have a maritime agreement between Turkey and Italy in the area of Peloponnese. Yes. You have to see there is a very interesting, uh, in YouTube, you have to see there is a very interesting agreement about Peloponnese, whether it is an island or, or not. You have to see it. It's very interesting. So before uh, we move to the next speaker, uh, I'd like, uh, to, I like to ask two questions, because you raised hands. So one and two, please. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Minister, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, I think that this presentation should be more widespread. But in the meantime, may I ask a question? All those claims by Turkey, um, whether they are irrelevant or totally, uh, let's say, uh, foolish, uh, do they create any realities we will face later on in, in any negotiation whenever this might happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. This is a very important question because the reality is that although the MOU between Turkey and Libya is totally against international law, it is there, it exists. In order to get rid of this, we have the following options. Option one, one of the two countries, either Turkey or Libya, are going to consider the agreement as null and void. Option two, we can go to the International Court of Justice and discuss the validity of the two agreements, the agreement between Greece and Egypt and the agreement between Turkey and Libya. Turkey, until 2019, Turkey was trying to explain international law of the sea in the way that it represented Turkey's interests. In November 2019, with this MOU, Turkey is, can say that now we have an agreement that it fits our needs. It is tailored in our needs. It may be against international law, but it is on the table. That is the reality. Last question, please. Thank you, Mr. Sirigos, for your presentation. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, we mostly care about what happens in the Mediterranean Sea. However, my question is about the Black Sea. What happens there? Is, uh, I mean, does Turkey have uh, some sort of similar claims uh, in the Black Sea? In the Black Sea, there was an agreement between Turkey and so the Soviet Union in the 1980s. 
and this uh, maritime uh, line, uh, this maritime boundary has been followed since the dissolution of the Soviet Empire and, uh, uh, well, Georgia, uh, Ukraine and Russia are following the same uh, line, are accepting this delimitation agreement as valid. And uh, there was another delimitation agreement between Bulgaria and Turkey in the Black Sea. So, as it concerns t Turkey, I think, mm, well, with the exception of an area between Romania and uh, Turkey, the rest of the area has been delimited between Turkey and the neighboring states in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, just a small follow-up question. Uh, so this means that after the annexation of Crimea from uh, the Russian Federation in 2014, the line still hasn't changed at all? It cannot change. Uh, Turkey knows what is its part. It mm -hmm. does not play any role. By the way, it seems that Turkey found on its uh, part very close to the limits of the boundary with uh, Russia and Ukraine. It seems that they have found... Uh, um, natural gas, and th that is the reason that uh, all the ships, the drilling ships of uh, Turkey, are now in the Black Sea because they are trying to see, they are working on the discovery of this uh, natural gas reserve in the area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for great questions, and also thank you very much, Minister Shigos, for a clear and comprehensive speech. And I now learn that every country has some sort of territorial problems or territorial difficulties. But I now learn that uh, Greece has been trying to solve these questions, problems, uh, based on international law, uh, by peaceful means. I think this is important because uh, in East Asia as well, we try to, Japan try to solve difficult questions based on international law and through negotiate, peaceful negotiations. That's why I suppose that professor of international law is very respected in this, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'd like to move to the next speaker. May I ask Professor Ken Jimbo to start your talk, please? Uh, apologies, I have to leave in uh, 10 minutes because uh, there is an extraordinary synod of uh, the rectors of the Greek universities and have to be there. So I, that is the reason that I have to leave. Otherwise, I would have liked to stay and discuss more. Okay, thank you very much. Please free, free, feel free. I to have leave. another 10 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So please uh, uh, start your presentation, Professor Kim Jimbo. Well, th thank you very much, Professor Hosoya. Um, uh, and I'd like to thank again for Ideas Pantheon and the Japanese Embassy uh, for hosting this event and uh, uh, Elia Mip for collaborating uh, on, on this uh, uh, occasion. Um, I think uh, this session uh, is designed for, uh, you know, exploring the future uh, potential uh, for cooperation between Japan and Greece, uh, especially focusing on the uh, free and open uh, maritime order. So uh, I'll try to be brief uh, to let uh, everybody to uh, offer uh, your thoughts on this, because uh, the more ideas uh, to be presented uh, in this seminar uh, will be uh, considered further uh, by the both governments and uh, all the stakeholders uh, in, uh, in, in, in Japan and also uh, in Greece. But I uh, let me try to focus uh, what is at stake uh, to secure uh, the maritime uh, security and safety. Uh, I think that could those uh, I think concepts could be applied uh, in both um, uh, what we face in Western Pacific, uh, which is uh, East China Sea and South China Sea, and what the Greece government um, are looking at the uh, Mediterranean Sea. Uh, I think minister have uh, outlined, uh, and I, I learned a lot um, on, on the how the kind of legal settlements uh, could be uh, made possible, uh, and uh, what the Greece have been encountering uh, the lots of uh, claims uh, by the neighboring uh, states. But I my focus is uh, particularly upon the the power struggle, uh, power relationship uh, uh, on, on these aspects, and. Uh, in terms of the maritime security, I think uh, what the strategists uh, are looking at are three domains. Uh, one is called the gray zone uh, coercion. Uh, that is the concept fall 
between uh, black and white, uh, which is black is uh, all out, uh, you know, um, uh, the the conflicts um, among those uh, military to military uh, crush between uh, those those uh, counterparts. Uh, and the white is a peaceful situation. And but uh, there are so many, uh, I think, uh, issues are uh, represented uh, fall uh, within those uh, gray zone uh, coercion, where you can see that no military actors are trying to challenge uh, those uh, territorial claims and maritime boundaries to uh, start their activities and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and then to try to create the fate accompli uh, to uh, create uh, uh, de facto change uh, of those uh, maritime boundary and the sovereignty uh, issues. So this is not a kind of military challenge that we face, but it is the sovereignty challenge that, that is posed by non-military entities. So uh, this is so-called the gray zone coercion, which require us to deal uh, in somewhat more sophisticated and the tune uh, you know, in way to deal with those uh, problems. And second uh, category we see is the low intensity conflicts. So it is not a kind of a highly escalatory uh, crush, but uh, the, uh, somewhat crush uh, between those uh, military, uh, 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 I think, um, domains uh, that involves the accidental crashes and the limited uh, military assaults. Um, this is important because, uh, uh, you know, the, those kind of crush could be uh, uh, to be begun uh, without such kind of uh, intended kind of escalation, uh, you know, control. Um, but uh, that that could that could start. And uh, it is very important that how we can really control the the crush uh, at the uh, low intensity level and not to let to escalate uh, into the uh, further uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, deeper crush between those states. And finally, uh, what we see today is the expanding so-called the anti-access and area denial uh, challenges. And uh, for us, that is China uh, that is accumulating uh, the, uh, the capabilities to control uh, the sea uh, and uh, also expanding the uh, concept of the air and the maritime superiority vis-a-vis -vis, uh, neighbors and even towards uh, the United States. So the management of the Senkaku, uh, for example, for uh, in 1990s, um, I think Japanese self-defense force were much confident uh, in managing the escalation because uh, if something escalates, uh, I think our maritime self-defense and air defense uh, could actually, uh, you know, really, um, uh, dominate the escalation because of our capability uh, could be regarded much uh, superior than what is at stake at the uh, uh, East China Sea vis-a-vis -vis China. But now that China is uh, much more superior uh, than uh, any of those uh, neighbors, so uh, we cannot really expect China to back off uh, from those claims, uh, even uh, through the, uh, uh, I think, a crisis uh, mode. So the crisis stability issues uh, is at stake uh, because uh, there has been a changing uh, perception of the creating uh, the, uh, I mean, creating the management uh, issues uh, because they are they become more confident uh, in dealing with this issue, issue back up uh, by those capabilities. So in the scope of the Northeast Asia, uh, the gray zone coercion that uh, we are trying to uh, uh, build up our ca own capability of the Coast Guard vessels. Uh, and that is very important to manage the gray zone uh, coercion because uh, that we want to keep the disputes and the uh, level of the conflict in the role of the law enforcement uh, and uh, uh, let to become more resilient, uh, not to let the kind of cross the boundary into the military uh, conflicts uh, uh, in order to do so that uh, both Jap Japan and China uh, needs to have a more sophisticated uh, capability of the maritime coast guards and more responsible in line with the, uh, you know, um, the rule of law, how they can manage uh, the maritime order, uh, especially in the East China Sea. And I think that uh, those efforts have already begun, uh, but the still that uh, the dynamics of the change is much faster in, in China because they are building up so many ships 
and the bigger ships and bigger weapons uh, that really changes the concepts of what the uh, maritime safety agency or the coast guards can really address because they are having a much bigger guns <laughs> than than Japanese coast guards uh, and 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 that really uh, creates the asymmetrical uh, balance between how they can manage uh, the uh, the law enforcement at sea. Uh, and then low intensity and ATAD challenges, and that is a role played by our maritime safety, uh, sorry, that the maritime uh, self-defense in connection with the uh, U.S. security umbrella, which is the U.S. forces in Japan, U.S. Navy uh, can play its role in controlling uh, the escalation. So it's, a, you know, carefully crafting the escalation ladder uh, because we will let those uh, Coast Guard to play the first kind of responder. Uh, in this conflict, but if that escalate into that scheme that the maritime self-defense force and eventually that the U.S. force uh, could be there uh, to manage uh, the escalation. And those, I think, a visible ladder uh, of the escalation uh, is very important way uh, that can we can have a strategic messaging uh, to China. If China corresponds uh, those kind of escalation ladder, we can have a more like a sophisticated way of uh, management in the each layer uh, of the conflict domain. Um, in the South China Sea, there's a similar kind of patterns that we have a gray zone, low intensity, and the A2, AD challenges. Uh, what I do have a concern is that not, uh, there's no such uh, clear boundary uh, among those uh, three areas because that uh, simply because the capability is more asymmetrical than what, we, what, you, what you can see between China uh, and Japan. Look at Philippines, look at Vietnam. Um, they do have the territorial claims that like uh, what the minister mentioned uh, in the Eastern Medi Mediterranean Sea, South China Sea is as messy as the Mediterranean Sea because there are so many islands and the shoals, uh, rocks uh, that, uh, you know, each those kind of, uh, you know, uh, claims uh, have been overlapped uh, with uh, each other. So it's very hard to find the median lines and uh, uh, economic exclusive zone among those uh, uh, claimants uh, in the South China Sea. But what is happening is the Chinese kind of dominance uh, in dealing with uh, those South China Sea claims by the so-called the nine dash lines almost covers the, um, you know, dominant areas of the um, uh, South China Sea. And what is at stake is that the China has been uh, reclaiming, I mean, uh, reclamation of those uh, islands. Uh, I think eight of them uh, have been already uh, been completed as a, as a fundamental construction has been made. And the China is said to be rapidly militarizing uh, by uh, constructing a lots of military facilities uh, in those islands. So I think a phase one is over already. And I think that uh, there has been the result of the complete loss of uh, South China Sea uh, claimants, I mean, the Southeast Asia claimants on, on those islands. So it is very hard to uh, kind of, uh, you know, let the China to back down from now because they have already done the first phase one. Uh, but I think it is uh, very important to resist, uh, to not to let the things worse uh, from here. And But it is very hard to uh, impose the cost uh, for China to uh, you know, proceed those, uh, uh, you know, uh, advancement of the maritime uh, interest uh, in South China Sea. But it's very important uh, that the South China, Southeast Asian nations and Japan, United States and other, uh, you know, uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, you know, get together to uh, put those kind of, uh, you know, uh, unclos uh, and also international uh, rule to be uh, exercised uh, in South China Sea. In that, in that sense that I'm particularly uh, ex uh, affecting that the uh, ASEAN's resiliency uh, in negotiation uh, of the so-called code of conduct uh, negotiation vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, it's been, they, they've been conducting for years, uh, but it's very hard to materialize, especially to uh, form uh, so-called the uh, rule-based uh, and also uh, conflict resolution uh, inclusion kind of uh, uh, based uh, agreements uh, between uh, ASEAN and, and also China. So uh, let me conclude by saying what could be the uh, potential ideas uh, that the Japan and Greece uh, can advance uh, together in cross-referencing what is at stake in the Mediterranean Sea and also in the maritime you know, uh, safety issues uh, that beyond 
your what what you're dealing with, uh, you know, in 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 your uh, in your Mediterranean Sea and what we are dealing with uh, uh, East and South China Sea. But I think it's very important uh, way to look at uh, to generalize the debate and make our claim to be more internationalized. And I think those are a very important effort uh, to be explored uh, by both uh, Japan uh, and Greece. Uh, in order to promote that, I have a humble <laughs> proposal, uh, as you can see uh, in following. Uh, one is, I think, uh, you know, advancement of the Japan-Greece dialogue uh, is very important. And uh, those types of the scholarly debates and tra track 1.5 or 2 debates are uh, important. But I think I will also recommend to let those um, Navy to Navy and Coast Guard to Coast Guard uh, dialogue uh, officialized process to move it uh, forward because th those are the guys uh, who are dealing directly uh, on these issues. And I think it is uh, best way to exchange the practices uh, of, uh, of each other. That's number one. And the second is a cross-referencing focuses. Um, and I think previous uh, sessions that there are uh, many presentation focusing upon the importance of the maritime domain awareness and the MDA is the critically important uh, issue that the Japan and the Greece uh, can advance further. Uh, what could be those generalized uh, uh, you know, standards of what we can promote in the MDA standards uh, with uh, those neighboring uh, countries. And coastal patrol is important and the best practices uh, at seas, we, we do have a so-called cues uh, that is the Navy to Navy kind of best practices uh, standards that uh, this is not the low, you know, legally binding uh, things, but uh, let those uh, standards to be shared among uh, those uh, uh, authorities and commanders uh, at the sea so that they can respect uh, those norms uh, when we when they have encounters uh, at sea, uh, they know what to avoid and what they can really find uh, the concept of the risks uh, between two sides. So uh, it is uh, not as, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, convince, convincing kind of legal measures uh, that you can expect, but uh, we can really start from those uh, building up of the practices uh, at the sea. And I think those are very important way. And I think a third, something that I expect uh, is the more visible participation of the regional exercise and training by uh, Greek forces and also the Japanese uh, self-defense force. And there have been the NATO operations, so-called the Sea Guardians, and also the NIRIS, I don't know how to, uh, how to pronounce it, but there has been the maritime exercises that uh, Greece, uh, Greek uh, forces have been uh, eagerly participating uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. And I think there will be a chance that the SDF uh, can, uh, you know, uh, participate uh, to, uh, you know, ex exchange those kind of practices. And at, at the same time, we can also have the further uh, uh, interoperability uh, with uh, between uh, Japanese self-defense force and Greek forces together with other NATO uh, member states. And also we do have a Japan-led multilateral maritime exercises. And uh, one of the uh, most important exercises we have is with the United States, but there has been the rise of uh, trends uh, in the multilateralization of those uh, exercises for, uh, for, for example, Malabar is the Quad, uh, Japan, US, Australia, and India uh, have been annually conducting the exercise with those uh, four countries. And also we do have a Cobra Gold in Thailand, um, Barikatan Bar in Philippines, uh, and other exercises in both Australia. And now what we see uh, is to invite the, all the regional members to uh, participate in those uh, regionally uh, oriented um, uh, exercises. And I think there will be a more uh, potential that the European member states, uh, including Greece, uh, will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, participating in those uh, multilateral exercises uh, altogether. So uh, I think th those are, I think, what I think the potential uh, for uh, both countries to uh, explore the further uh, collaboration uh, with uh, each other. And I prepare some slides for the free and open in the Pacific that, that um, you know, expands not only with those uh, uh, military domain, but I think uh, that if that you can, uh, you know, expand into the strategic assets at sea, uh, for example, the how to, uh, you know, uh, build it, you know, the safety of the uh, coast, um, uh, co uh, coastal safety measures, uh, creating the ports uh, and also uh, exchanging uh, of the, uh, you know, um, uh, those uh, best practices. 
and uh, create, creating a quality infrastructure in line with, uh, you know, uh, Indo-Pacific kind of investment quality investment uh, uh, structures. And those are, I think, uh, creating the more like a, a comprehensive pathway and uh, uh, and the platform for uh, all, all the business sectors and uh, politicians uh, also can uh, plug and play. Uh, into uh, a wider spectrum of cooperation uh, in the maritime uh, security uh, between two countries. So I'll stop here and look, look forward to the further discussion. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, Professor Takahara? Yes, now I can hear okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. So you, you, you couldn't hear my previous uh, comments. No. Okay, <laughs> anyway, I'm just uh, thanked uh, Professor Kenjimbo's talk and I uh, would like to move on to the third speaker, Professor Takahara. So could you start your presentation, please? Thank you very much. Right. Thank you so much, Hosea sensei um, Just listening to uh, Professor Jinbo's very detailed and concrete proposal, I really have nothing to add. But just an episode, you know, 10 years ago, when China started acting very assertively or even aggressively in the East China Sea, Japan tried to tell the world that this is not a bilateral issue uh, because many countries just saw that this was something to do with only Japan and China. But we were trying to tell the world that, no, no, this is a matter of international principles, that you should not change the status quo by physical force. Uh, but if you have differences, you have to solve them through um, peaceful means and through international law and and rules that we have. Uh, and I think only now or recently, uh, people have come to understand the importance uh, of the point that we were trying to make uh, 10 years ago. Um, because of the series of very unfortunate events, perhaps in the East China Sea, South China Sea to Ukraine, uh, but, um, and people are increasingly anxious, I think, about the future of the international order. But all the, more, all the more, or just because of these um, things happening in front of us, I think countries like uh, Greece and Japan uh, must get together and say, uh, keep on saying to the world that um, a rules-based order is most important uh, to the welfare and the stability uh, of um, us all. Uh, and I think that's the message that transcended uh, the sessions that we attended uh, today. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the invitation uh, to this very important workshop once again. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Takahara. Can you hear my voice? Thank you very much. Thank you very much yes, for adding your variable wisdom to the discussion of this session. Thank you very much indeed. And then I'd like to move on to the fourth and final speaker. And could you uh, start your presentation? Uh, uh. I want to, to comment before starting to the very concrete proposals that uh, Professor Jimbo made. They're excellent proposals. I, I second to them. I underwrite them. And uh, some proposals I had in mind I mean, they, they, they are covered by Jimbo, uh, Professor Jimbo's proposals. So uh, yes, this is the way forward to my mind. So I started from the end and I will uh, move on. Somehow the last panel wraps up whatever has been said before. Uh, countries, we have uh, to face two revisionist powers who want to impose their geopolitical, let's say, vision, in spite of international law, in contravening the international law. Both these countries are former empires, and they have you no know, this idea of the, their empire past, and they're a revisionist in this way. Uh, and because of their behavior, which is bullying, we see that the littoral countries, either in the South China Sea or in, uh, in Eastern Mediterranean, they have this tendency to, to group together and to face, you know, 
the threatening situation. Uh, in the in what has to do in the case Mediterranean, we talk about it a little bit. We had these initiatives, the three plus one initiatives, Greece, Cyprus, and Egypt, and the United States, and Greece, Cyprus, and uh, Israel, and the United States. And we had this Philia Forum, and the East, Med Mediterranean, uh, East uh, Mediterranean Gas Forum, which, for which I, I talked to you before. All these were attempts for stability and cooperation in the area. They were not exclusive forums. The thing was that Turkey didn't want to participate because they wouldn't under, uh, recognize the existence of Cyprus, which was part of all these forums. Uh, so what we, we see here, although somebody said before that this is not a bilateral issue, and I agree, it's not a bilateral issue between Greece and Turkey, strictly bilateral. It's neither a bilateral issue what happens in the eastern, uh, in the South China Sea between Japan and Turkey. To the contrary, there are many countries involved, Vietnam, Philippines, etc., Malaysia, whatever. The thing is that the way I see it, Turkey sees as the main obstacle into achieving its goal and as a structural adversary, Greece and uh, Cyprus, to a lesser extent, whether Japan, uh, China sees a structural adversary, Japan. I mean, the one who stays, who has power enough, maybe, to become an obstacle into, into coming to, the, to imposing this, this view. Both Greece and Japan, we want to, not to exclude, but to include China and, uh, and, uh, and Turkey, respectively. I mean, as we talked before, the, the, uh, the FOIP too tries to include, and that's, that's very good. This is how we must proceed, to include the BRI initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative in it. Because you cannot work by excluding a big power. Greece also wanted to, to include Turkey and tries to include, and this is what we try to do through the exploratory talks and then the other talks. But in order for that to happen, we have to have a common basic understanding. And this common basic understanding cannot be different than the international law and the law of the seas. Both Turkey and, and China try to entice the other countries towards their project. I mean, if you see from the, from the intervention of uh, Mr. Sirigos before, Turkey was extremely generous concerning the, the boundaries of the sea, sea lanes, sea zones, but generous on the expense of Greece and, uh, uh, and Cyprus. If you take all the EZ and the continental shelf of Greece and Cyprus, then you can split it and give it to, to the rest of the world. Uh, but of course the countries didn't accept that. The, in the same vein, China is trying to be generous uh, from, with loans and development cooperation with the countries of uh, South China Sea. And we have seen a partial success on that. I mean, Philippines took them to the, since the International Court of Hague, but then they tried to appease, uh, and they're still trying to appease China, because everybody wants to have good relation with China, and everybody wants China's money. Uh, now, what I want to say is that, uh, and to complete what I was saying before, that both China and, uh, and uh, Turkey what they apply as a tactic or a strategy is this anti-access and area denial. It has been said before. And they don't hesitate, if they need to be, they don't want to go straight to confrontation. They try other ways, as I said. But if it needs to be, they don't hesitate to prompt uh, uh, confrontation and to uh, 
Trump escalation. And I think the way I see it, I mean, I have seen the way China uses in South China Sea its uh, trawlers and the fishing boats, which are nothing, it's all but the fishing boat. And China tried to copycat the same thing with the fishing boats in the Aegean. So I, I understand that in this interconnectivity of the world, each country sees what happens to the other parts of the world and they copycat. If they see that something works, or that the international community doesn't react much, they say it's okay, it's a good tactic, let's, let's bring it here. Now, having in mind that we have so many things in common, and that we have, and this is the most crucial, we have common values and a common way, a common worldview, the two countries, it's a pity that we don't have more closer relations, Greece and Japan, I mean, and this is the, the thing that we're discussing today. And I believe this conference, it might be a very small step, but it's a step on this uh, direction to closer cooperation, to begin a dialogue at least. The reason is probably in the past, it was the geography, we were too far apart, and uh, the, the distance always matters. The second is that Japan after the 50s was an export-oriented economy and Greece was a small market. So naturally, never Greece was you know, on the center of <laughs> Japan's attention regarding Europe or the rest of the world. But that was the reason our political contacts were kept on a minimum, although we didn't have problems, we had good relations, always good relations, never contradictions or any other thing. But as the world became smaller and smaller and more interconnected, things changed. It's not like in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s where distance mattered. Distance mattered less and less every day. And we face a common problem. And I will explain what I mean as a common problem. Saying, first of all, that when we say the West, we don't mean a geographical area. Japan is much more West, for example, than Hungary today. West is a way of life, is a worldview. West is the democracy, the liberal values, the human rights, the political rights, the state of law, etc., etc. This is the West. And what we see today, and what we see, and what happens in Ukraine is not irrelevant, is that we have two competing ideas or worldviews about the international system. The Western one, which sees the countries as sovereign, independent, with the right to decide where they want to go, with whom they want to, to, to which alliance or group of people or, 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 or union they want to, to, to belong, or to go back to an imperial past of the 18th or 19th century when you had the balance of powers, when you had big powers, whatever that is, with spheres of influence, and where in their sphere of influence there were literally imposing their will to the countries who were unlucky enough to be. And so it's, we have a class of di different worldviews, and it's obvious that Greece and Japan have the same worldview. And it's obvious that Greece and Japan have the same idea about the need to, to co for cooperation, but on the basis of the international law and the law of the seas. So having this in mind, why don't we have more and closer relations? Part of, the, uh, part of the answer is this, but just a part of the answer. Uh, while the countries that are adversaries of China, for example, or their adversaries, literal or not literal, of Russia, they have their enemy or their opponent on the other side of NATO, on the other side of the West versus 
non-West worldview. For Greece, the problem is a little bit more tricky because our opponent is part of NATO and as is fence sitting, and Turkey was fence sitting the whole of her history, is with one foot on the West and the other foot outside and goes from here to there as it suits them. But for Greece, that is a problem. The second problem for Greece is that we have opened these issues, Cyprus being one of them, a very important issue. So there is a limit to how much we can alienate a permanent member of the United... But now we're talking <laughs> the things as they are, not as we want it to be. So for Greece, always what China says or does is important. And now we have very much uh, injured our relations with uh, Russia. Do we have, do we have a, a lot of room to, to, to break our relations with China as well? Not much room for maneuver on this account. Russia and China are two of the five permanent members of the UN Council, Security Council. So we have to take into account all this. So coming to some how a conclusion, yes, we need more cooperation, more dialogue. Have in mind that Japan doesn't have, which is a, a rich country, they don't have a, a, a defense attaché in Greece. How can we have a, a military dialogue? Greece at some point would, we assigned the defense attaché in Japan, didn't go well, he came back, but at some point at least we tried. Probably there was not much interest from the Japanese side. We need to start staff dialogue, military dialogue, political dialogue. We have so many things in common. And yes, I submit and I, I, I undersign whatever Professor Jimbo said. We have to do more for more cooperation. We have common values and common interests. And the main common interest is that we should apply the law of the seas in the maritime issues. And this is not just for us. The world is better when it's a rules-based international system. Much better for everybody. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Diakopoulos. Uh, you brilliantly wrapped up many discussion of today, and particularly I'm impressed by your talk that, well, we need to really advance uh, security cooperation. Japan has been expanding uh, security cooperation with like-minded country. And of course, uh, we should include it uh, in, in it, uh, kind of a creation of a military attaché in the Japanese embassy. So when you will come back to the position of national security advisor to prime minister, maybe then Japan oh, yeah. has a military <laughs> attaché in our own embassy. Yes. So I like to have a few uh, questions or comments from the floor. So one, could you, uh, so could you bring a microphone uh, to a gentleman there? And there are one question and two questions, so I will stop here. We have two questions. Yes, please. Yeah, my question has to do with the AUKUS deal that was recently signed between Britain, the States, and the Australia. And uh, if this uh, deal is welcomed from uh, Japan, Japanese side, and if uh, it can, uh, if, it, if yes, if it can uh, escalate the friction between China and Japan, potentially. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask Professor Jimbo to answer the question of AUKUS. Maybe uh, you are familiar with the issue of the AUKUS. So could you answer whether the AUKUS will uh, uh, endanger our, or our relationship with China or will, will intimidate China in a way? So do you have, uh, do, could you share your wisdom to, with us, please? Well, sh short answer, answer is that if China is intimidated, uh, that is very good news for us. <laughs> but, but that's that's a, a little bit ironical uh, answer uh, to this. But I thank you for questioning about the uh, AUKUS. Um, and the AUKUS remains to be a very functional uh, agreement uh, because uh, this is the arrangement for Australia's to acquire the next generation submarines uh, from the current Collins class diesel propulsion submarine to the 
uh, nuclear propulsion uh, submarines. And back in the previous negotiation, uh, Japan was the one who tried to uh, participate in the bidding processes of the Australian uh, submarine projects by uh, uh, selling our solar cross uh, diesel submarine, but the uh, French uh, actually took over uh, the deal. And now the French has been uh, taken over by uh, the UK. So, so those are the kind of sequence of the processes uh, they, they have. But what does it mean for the Indo-Pacific security is I think a bigger question. And I think Australia now perceives uh, that the, their maritime interests uh, has been uh, challenged by the uh, maritime advancement of China in the wider scale, which requires Australia to expand their geographical scope of the underwater capabilities uh, into the Indian Ocean, uh, South Pacific Islands, and also to the Pacific Ocean, that requires the long, uh, longer range uh, of the duration of their operations uh, in the maritime domain. And that requires them to, uh, I think, commit to the uh, underwater capability by the nuclear uh, submarine. So I think uh, that is really a challenge to the, you know, Chinese strategic calculation because underwater capability has been, un, uh, you know, um, uh, strengthened by from the down under. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that will also create a good underwater, uh, you know, Navy to Navy cooperation between the United States uh, and uh, Australia as well. And hopefully that uh, those uh, uh, AUKUS agreement could be connected with uh, other like-minded states uh, like uh, Japan uh, and also other uh, members in the Indo-Pacific. And the maritime domain, uh, you know, cooperation is not only limited to the uh, underwater welfare, but also with uh, surface vessels, uh, exchange of the intelligence, and also wider range of the securing of the sea lanes uh, of uh, communications. So I think, uh, you know, AUKUS is one very symbolical. Uh, it's been widely published, but I think it's a one of uh, many, uh, I think, potential uh, framework uh, that the Indo-Pacific can uh, also establish. So we can have a quad. We do have, a you know, the lots of like a minilateral agreements uh, and also the bilateral agreements. So uh, those are, I think, uh, way uh, uh, that I uh, wish to present. Uh, I think Hosea san have a, a additional viewpoints of this. No, no, no. You, thank you very much, Professor Jimbo. You answered brilliantly, most ideally. Thank you very much indeed. And I, I want to have the last question from the floor with a gentleman over there. Uh, thank you. My question is referring to the previous session uh, where Professor Takahara mentioned that uh, China plans to take the Senkaku or the Yaoyu Islands. Um, should such an event occur, how would that benefit China and uh, how would that influence or affect uh, Japan as one of the biggest uh, powers of the world in Japan's economy? Well, thank you very much for the question. Professor Takahara, could you uh, 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 hear the question? Floor the floor. I, I think so. Um, Please. One yeah. answer would be, you know, we don't think that China will actually act militarily uh, to take the islands at this point of time, but rather, you know, Sun Tzu art of war, that is to win without actual fighting. So by exerting pressure, uh, they are hoping that Japan will eventually concede and give in and start to say, well, we can co-administer the place or things like that. I, I suppose that's what the Chinese are hoping for at the moment. But why do they have to do this? Um, that's, uh, I think, the question perhaps that is included in what was said. Um, and uh, originally it was for oil. Uh, you know, in the late 1960s, there was a, a survey conducted by a, a United Nations organization that claimed it found a very potentially huge um, oil uh, bed uh, near the um, the Senkakus. Um, but nowadays, I don't think it's resources, but rather uh, nationalistic um, political uh, implications are more important, perhaps. Um, that's what the Chinese Communist Party needs. You know, they're teaching their children that these are uh, uh, holy territory, uh, you know, inherently 
uh, belonging to uh, our, our nation. And um, now that they have the capabilities, uh, they are pressed to act uh, on um, recovering uh, these claimed uh, places. Uh, I, I suppose that's the major reason. And um, the military aspect of owning the Senkakus has been discussed, uh, but I'm not a real expert on, on this. So if uh, other people would like to add uh, that element to it, uh, I think uh, that's most welcome. Um, but that's all from me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Takahara, for answering a good question. And now uh, we need to close this session and also to end today's event. And uh, already uh, Mr. Diakopoulos was kind enough to wrap up all the discussion of today. And particularly, I'm impressed by his remark that we, I mean, the Japan and Greece, have been facing two greatest empires, I mean, Ottoman Empire and the Chinese Empire. We are, are kind of a periphery, at the periphery of these two empires. And usually, empire didn't have fixed national borders. It can expand as long as it, it, it like, because it's a powerful empire. So that's why we have problems. But the point is that both Greece and Japan are trying to solve and respond to problems peacefully uh, with a negotiation based on international law try to avoid any conflict happen. I think this is really, really important. That's why I think that we have many things in common between Japan and Greece, to collaborate to create a stable and a peaceful order together. And uh, uh, with this, I like to wrap up and end this session. And thank you very much for all who come here to this room uh, uh, after the COVID-19. And also I'm particularly uh, grateful once again, uh, to uh, organizer of this event at the University of Pantheon and also Japanese Embassy. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.